started here. So I'm going to call the meeting to order. Uh, so the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. And I don't think there are any additions or changes um, of order or anything that I am anticipating right now, unless others have um, other information than that. Um, Looks all good to me. Okay, yep. uh, so without objection, um, we'll consider the uh, agenda approved. Um, and then, uh, so general business and appearances. So this is an opportunity for any member of the public to make a comment on any topic that is otherwise not on our agenda uh, for the evening. And um, if you would say your name and where you live and um, uh, try to keep your comments to uh, two minutes or less, that would be excellent uh, so that everyone gets a chance to speak. Um, so uh, just a couple notes about that as we move forward. Um, I know there are um, some folks here who probably want to uh, talk about policing and um, that's fine and welcome. And um, we, uh, I just want to make a note that if you want to talk about policing in general, um, <clears throat> basically now would be the time to do that uh, during general business and appearances. Um, and if you want to talk specifically about um, or anything related to the budget, um, then I would re recommend that you hold that comment until we are talking about the budget um, update, which is um, item 11. So um, that, I just want to make sure that that is really clear. And um, please don't be offended if I um, interrupt you to say, oh, you know, make, you know, save that comment for this other agenda item or, or whatnot. Um, just trying to help help everybody, uh, you know, make the comment when it makes sense and, and direct traffic a little bit. So uh, just a heads up about that. Um, so that's, that's one thing. And uh, for general business and appearances, I am actually going to, to kick us off uh, with a statement um, because this is uh, Pride Month. Um, and so uh, we have a, a statement about that. Uh, so I'm just gonna, um, I uh, jump into that here first. Um, so this is a, a commemorating the 51st anniversary of uh, the Stonewall Riots uh, of June 1969. Uh, so on June 28th, 1969, uh, at the Stonewall Inn in New York City's Greenwich Village, members of our lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, and, and asexual LGBTQIA+, uh, community took an unprecedented move against the political, social, and legal oppression they faced, resulting in the multiple day Stonewall riots. These community members, many of whom identified among the most oppressed and marginalized in our community, including transgender people, people of color, people experiencing homelessness, and sex workers, summoned the courage and conviction to stand up for their own freedoms and liberation. The LGBTQIA community across the United States first commemorated the Stonewall riots with the first Pride marches taking place in New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco in June 1970. Each subsequent annual Pride commemoration of the riots has inspired a continued movement towards equality and, inclu and inclusion. There are pride festivals and parades celebrated in solidarity across the globe during this time of year. And we want to acknowledge uh, the history of this month and its importance to many of our uh, Montpelier community members. So thank you and uh, happy Pride 2020. So thanks for uh, indulging me on that uh, to go first here. Um, and so, yeah, beyond that, oh, and we have Donna now. Wonderful, welcome. Um, so if you have something you would like to say, um, you can either, actually, I'm going to let Cameron describe this, the blue hand, or you can um, unmute yourself. Cameron, do you want to describe this? Sure. So everyone involved in the meeting, if you hit the participant button at the bottom of your screen, it should allow you to raise your hand, which is how we'd love to be able to see if you would like to participate and have something to say. Um, if you are having an issue with that, you can always turn on your camera and wave to the camera and I will note your name. And if you're having an issue with that as well, feel free to unmute yourself when no one else is talking until we can acknowledge you um, so we can add you to the queue. 
um, but I really would recommend the raising the blue hand, which is by clicking the participants um, button at the bottom of your screen, because that allows us to um, put everyone in a line. Um, so that would be really helpful to us. And we already have two folks that, oh, one, two, yes. We have a couple folks who've raised their hands, starting with um, Rachel Kempel, Stephanie Gamori, Allison Burns, and Lauren Griswold. Sorry, can you say that again? Rachel Kempel. Stephanie Gamori, yep. Allison Burns, Lauren Griswold, and now a Claire Coston. Okay. Uh, all right. So um, we'll just go right in that order. So Rachel, you are up first. So go ahead and, and unmute, unmute yourself. Hi, my name's Rachel. Um, I live on Hubbard Street in Montpelier. Um, I'm here to tell the mayor, the city council, and the city manager that to create a community that truly respects the dignity of, of, and humanity of all who live, work, and visit Montpelier, the Montpelier Police Department must be abolished. Systematic racism means that the outcomes of our system are racist. That means even if all the individuals within that system are not racist, or better yet, actively anti-racist, the outcomes of the system would still be racist. This is true of all policing and our entire justice system. We know abolition won't happen overnight. It's a long process we all must go through together as a community. This includes examining why and how police function to begin with and acknowledging that policing has its roots in white supremacy and racism. We must implement new systems of justice, emergency response, and conflict resolution. The resolution honoring outgoing Chief Fakos lists such achievements as starting modern initiatives surrounding policing and leading a compassionate approach to policing. We're glad that the council acknowledges the benefits of relying less on armed individuals to rock, respond to calls for assistance from the community. But we will not let the changing of the guard and the appointment of a new chief distract us from the fact that policing itself is rooted in racism and white supremacy. As such, it is harmful to people of color in Montpelier. It's harmful to people affected by poverty, people struggling with mental illness, and many other community members. We ask now that you actively work towards the goals of creating structures that will eventually take the place of the police department. In the meantime, we'll continue to bring the community together to discuss these issues. At the city council meeting on June 10th, we communicated a list of demands that we will now be refining to guide the city's actions towards this goal. We demand the council take them to heart and act upon them in this next fiscal year's budget. Thank you. All right. Oh, thank you. And you're well-timed, by the way. Um, thank you very much, Rachel. All right. um, Stephanie, are you ready? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie Gomery, and I am a resident of District 2. I live on Ewing Street, and I work in Montpelier as well. I am also here to tell the mayor, the city council, and the city manager that to create a community that truly respects the dignity and humanity of all who live, work, and visit Montpelier, as you wish to do, Montpelier Police Department must be abolished. Systematic racism means that the outcomes of our systems are racist. It means that even if all the individuals within the system are not racist, or even yet are trying to be actively anti-racist, the outcomes of the system would still be racist. This is true of all policing and our entire justice system as well. We know that abolition will not happen overnight. It is a long process we all must and can go through together as a community. This includes examining why and how police function to begin with, whether it's in a large city or a place like Montpelier, and acknowledging that policing has its roots in white supremacy and racism. We must implement new systems of justice, emergency response, and conflict resolution. The resolution tonight honoring outgoing FACOS lists such achievements as starting modern initiatives surrounding policing and leading a compassionate approach to policing. We're really glad that the city council acknowledges the benefits of doing this, but we will not let the changing of the guard and the appointment of a new chief distract us from the fact that policing itself is rooted in racism and white supremacy. As such, it is harmful to people of color in Montpelier, and it is also harmful to people affected by poverty, people struggling with mental illness, and so many others. 
So we ask now that you actively work towards the goals of creating structures that we will eventually make the police obsolete because we just won't need them. In the meantime, we will continue to bring the community together to discuss these issues. And as many of you know, at the city council meeting on June 10th, we communicated a list of demands that we will now be refining as a group to guide the city's actions toward this goal. We demand the council take these to heart and act upon them in the next fiscal year budget. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, Allison, are you ready to go? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi, my name is Allison Burns and I'm a white cis female math teacher and I live in East Montpelier. I spoke at city council two weeks ago and again, here I'm here to emphasize words are not enough. We must work towards being anti-racist and supporting our black indigenous and people of color community members through our actions. And that starts with defunding our police department. I'm here to tell the mayor, the city council and the city manager that to create a community that truly respects the dignity and humanity for all who live, work and visit in Montpelier, the Montpelier Police Department must be abolished. Systemic racism means that the outcomes of our systems are racist. That means even if all the individuals within that system are not racist or better yet actively anti-racist, the outcomes of the system would still be racist. This is true of all policing, our entire justice system, and many more systems. We know abolition won't happen overnight. It's a long process we all must go through together as a community. This includes examining why and how police function to begin with and acknowledging that policing has its roots in white supremacy and racism. We must implement new systems of justice, emergency response, and conflict resolution. The resolution honoring outgoing Chief ACOS lists such achievements as starting modern initiatives surrounding policing and leading a compassionate approach to policing. We are glad that the council acknowledges the benefits of relying less on armed individuals to respond to calls for assistance from the community, but it's not enough. We will not let the changing of the guard and the appointment of a new chief distract us from the fact that policing itself is rooted in racism and white supremacy. As such, it is harmful to people of color in Montpelier. It is also harmful to people affected by poverty, people struggling with mental illness, and many others. I would also, again, like to highlight the specific request to immediately remove the school resource officer from Montpelier schools. Armed officers have no place in our schools, and the funding would be much better spent on more trained mental health professionals in the schools. We ask that you take action now to work towards those goals of creating structures that will eventually take the place of the police department. In the meantime, we will continue to bring the community together to discuss these issues, and we will continue to refine our demands. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Lauren. Hi guys. My name is Lauren Griswold. I live here in Montpelier in district one on the top of the Bailey Ave Hill. Uh, I'm here to tell you the mayor at the city council and the city manager that to create a community that truly respects the dignity and humanity of all who live, work and visit Montpelier, the Montpelier police department must be abolished. If that sounds like strong language to you, I ask that you both take the time to thoroughly educate yourself on the concept and that you consider the civic weight of this moment in history and your responsibility as elected officials when your constituents demand transformation. Racism, racism is systemic, such that, that in all outcomes of our systems are racist. Even if each individual within a system is not racist, the outcomes of the system they function in will still be racist. This is true of all policing in our entire justice system. We know abolition won't happen overnight. It's a long process we all must go through together as a community. This includes examining why and how police function to begin with and acknowledging that policing has its roots in white supremacy and racism. We must implement new systems of justice, emergency response, and conflict resolution. The resolution honoring outgoing Chief Fakos lists such achievements as starting modern initiatives surrounding policing and leading a compassionate approach to policing. We're very glad that the council acknowledges the benefits of relying less on armed individuals to respond to calls for assistance from the community. But we will not let the changing of the guard distract us from the fact that policing itself is rooted in racism and white supremacy. As such, it's harmful to people of color in Montpelier. It's also harmful to people affected by poverty, people struggling with mental illness, and many others. We ask now that you actively begin creating structures that will eventually take the place of the police department. In the meantime, we'll continue to bring the community together to discuss these issues. We previously communicated a list of demands that we will now be refining to guide the city's actions towards this goal. We demand the council take them to heart and act upon them in the next fiscal year budget. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Um, Claire, are you ready to go? 
Hello. Uh, my name is Claire Claston. I live on Hubbard Street, and I'm here to tell the mayor, the city council, and the city manager that to create a community that truly respects the dignity and humanity of all who live, work, and visit Montpelier, the Montpelier Police Department must be abolished. Systematic racism means that the outcomes of our systems are racist. That means even if all the individuals within that system are not racist, or better yet, actively anti-racist, the outcomes of the systems will still be racist. This is true of all policing and our entire judicial justice system. We know abolition won't happen overnight. It is a long process we all must go through together as a community. This includes examining why and how police function to begin with and to acknowledge that policing has its roots in white supremacy and racism. We must implement new systems of justice, emergency response, and conflict resolution. The resolution honoring outgoing Chief Bacos lists such achievements as starting modern initiatives surrounding policing and leading a compassionate approach to policing. We are glad the city, the council acknowledges the benefits of relying less on armed individuals to respond to calls for assistance from the community. But we will not let the changing of the guard distract us from the fact that policing itself is rooted in racism and white supremacy. As such, it is harmful to people of color in Montpelier. It is also harmful to people affected by poverty, people struggling with mental illness, and many others. We ask now that you actively work towards the goal of creating structures that will eventually take the place of the police department. In the meantime, we will continue to bring the community together to discuss these issues. At the City Council meeting on June 10th, we communicated a list of demands that we will now be refining to guide the city's actions toward this goal. We demand the council to take them to heart and act upon them in the fiscal, next fiscal year's budget. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was the initial list. Cameron, is there anyone else? Yes, ma'am. I have David Hershey. Constantinos, Johnny Wood, Colin Keegan, and Isla Bristol. Can you, uh, so I only got a couple of those. So David. Yep. David Hershey. Yep. Constantinos, Johnny Flood, Colin yep. Keegan. Sorry, what, what was that name? Colin Keegan. Colin Keegan, okay. And Isla Bristol. Okay, thank you. And again, we will go in that order. Um, uh, and and just before we continue, um, John, you you've got all the information you need from the folks who've already previously gone. Yes, all their little names are conveniently all the names, not their little names, but all the names are in little boxes on the screen. So I'm good. There we go. And, um, and like where they live and stuff, that's, that's information you have as well. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. And, uh, again, um, uh, right. So say your name and where you live. Great. Thanks so much. Um, David Hershey. Hi, my name is David Hershey. Um, I live in East Montpelier. I also spoke two weeks ago at the city council meeting. Um, and I am also here to ask that you guys continue to consider, um, abolition as the ultimate goal when you're talking about budgeting for the police department. Um, like others have said before me, systemic racism is not something that can be solved through reforms of the systems that currently exist. It involves taking a systemic approach um, to change, to making change within our city and, and surrounding towns that are affected. Um, and so I'm going to ask that you, as you consider the budget for next year, um, take into consideration how much of the police department could be served through roles of uh, that don't involve people with weapons responding to calls. Um, I did. I took a look at the city manager's, um, or I don't know what to call it, article um, in the in the bridge last week. Um, and I do. I'm a middle school teacher, and I just wanted to respond specifically to the the community policing, which involves the school resource officer, and ask that you really consider removing that. I think that um, the benefits people tend to see from school resource officers at the schools I've worked at and continue to work at um, are, are viewed from the viewpoint of administration uh, who are almost always white in Vermont. Um, and then also just like from the perspective, not of people who are negatively affected. And I think um, like it's like the school I work at right now, which is not in Montpelier. Um, they used the system preparedness, the ALICE training, which is mentioned in here. Um, as an excuse to assign our school a school resource officer. 
And, and I mean, thankfully he's almost completely uninvolved in our school. Um, and so he, you know, there's not a person walking around my building with a gun every single day. Um, but I think that the evidence in the research and, and we'll continue to talk about this at future council meetings, but the, the evidence shows that having a police officer in the building of a school doesn't actually um, reduce the likelihood of any sort of disaster, which that training is meant to prepare us teachers for um, and our students for. Um, and so I think ultimately the only research that exists is that which shows a negative effect of that school resource officer. And so please continue to consider that as you look at your budget for the city. Thank you. Great, thanks. And um, I just wanna be clear if your comments mostly pertain to um, like this, some of the words that we've been um, you know, hearing previously, they sort of, there are some ties to, to the budget. Um, that's fine. Um, but if your comments mostly pertain to budget items, I uh, recommend that you wait till, uh, we're actually talking about the budget a bit later on, but thank you though. Um, nonetheless, Mayor? your point is well taken. <laughs> Mayor? Yes. If I may, just on behalf of the folks that are testifying, most of them have been talking about next year's budget process. Um, I think the budget we're talking about here at this meeting is our just our adjustments for COVID related. At least that's what I understood. That they yeah. were talking about a longer term thing. So uh, it seems so, probably on point. So, oh, okay, so it is probably on point then. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Never mind. Fabulous, um, Donna. Uh, I wanted to ask David if he would share his research with us that you said dealt with. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of oh. trying to compile something that's more organized uh, since school. Yeah, if you could just and, forward some like. links, that would be helpful. Yeah, I'd love to. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, Constantinos, are you ready? Hi. <laughs> I'm Constantinos Tavares. I'm a resident of District 2, and I'm also here to tell the, uh, the Mayor, City Council, and City Manager that to create a community that truly respects the dignity and humanity of, of everyone who lives here, works here, or visits the city, uh, that the Montpelier Police Department must be abolished. Uh, systematic racism means that the outcomes of our systems are racist. Um, that means even if all the individuals within that system are not racist or even anti-racist, the outcomes of that system will still be racist. And this is true of all policing, our justice system, and, and basically everything else that this country was founded on. Uh, so we know that the abolition won't happen overnight. It's going to be a long process. We're all going to have to do it together uh, as a community discussing really um, what the function of police is um, and acknowledging that policing does have its roots in white supremacy and racism. Um, so to overcome that, we need to implement new systems of justice, emergency response, and conflict resolution. Uh, so the resolution honoring outgoing Chief Vacos lists such achievements as starting modern initiatives surrounding policing and leading a compassionate approach to policing. And we're happy that the council acknowledges that there's benefits to relying less on armed individuals to respond to calls for assistance from the community. Uh, we're not going to let the changing of the guard and the appointment of a new chief distract us from the fact that policing itself uh, is rooted in racism and white supremacy. It's harmful to people of color in Montpelier. It's harmful to people affected by poverty, to people struggling with mental illness, and, and many other people that end up in contact with the police. Uh, we ask that you actively work towards the goals of creating structures that will eventually take the place of the police department. In the meantime, we're con we'll continue to bring the community together and discuss these issues. Uh, at the city council meeting on June 10th, we communicate a list of demands and we'll now be refining them and guide the city's actions towards that goal. Uh, we demand that the council take these to heart and act upon them in the next fiscal year's budget. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Johnny. Good evening. Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Johnny Flood. I was born and raised in Woodbury, Vermont, and I currently live and work in Montpelier as a preschool teacher. Um, I, I agree with all the statements made tonight in support of abolishing the Montpelier Police Department. Uh, we, we have spent generations in this country and in this state divesting from our communities and investing instead in the most authoritarian elements in our society. Uh, elements that call for guns and cages as the solutions for poverty, for, for mental illness, for drug addiction and homelessness. And uh, th this is not only a political failing, th this is a moral and ethical failing of the highest order. And as a result, black and indigenous people of color have, as has always been the case in our country, suffered the most. And Vermont and Montpelier are far from innocent of this. We need courage from those in power we need bold and creative solutions. And I agree wholeheartedly with the list of demands presented to the city council on June 10th. And I sincerely hope that you all take these to heart and actively work to implement them in good faith. 
Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Colin. Yes. Hello, uh, my name is Colin Keegan. I currently live in Burlington, but I lived in Montpelier for close to two years until this past December, and I still work in Montpelier. Uh, I'm calling in to support the demands to abolish the Montpelier Police Department. As others have said, we know the work of abolition will take some time, and it's a process we all have to engage in together as a community. This work will require taking an active look at what purposes the police department serve and what they can be replaced with. This call rests on the understanding that policing is part of a criminal justice system rooted in white supremacy and systemic racism. This history is well documented. There are a lot of sources out there. A uh, few that I found, found valuable are uh, stamped from the beginning by Eber Max Candy, a book, a uh, documentary on Netflix, 13th, and the podcast seen on radio, that's S-C-E-N-E. -E. If any of you have not been educating yourselves on how systemic racism has shaped this country and persists in American society today, I really urge you to do so because it affects all of us and we're all complicit in it. And there is obviously a lot of other sources out there besides the few that I mentioned. Systemic racism means that our systems lead to racist outcomes regardless of the individuals within the system. This is true of all policing and our entire criminal justice system. I'm echoing the others on this call and recognizing that bringing in a new police chief won't solve these problems. The structure is the problem. And there's a growing popular awareness right now, really among a lot of white people. It seems like black people have been aware of these issues forever uh, around the insidiousness and pervasiveness of white supremacy in our culture. The question is what we're gonna do about it. We have an opportunity to thoroughly re-envision public safety and lead from that vision. I will continue to work with the others on this call and other members of the community to help bring forward this vision. It starts with the demands made at the June 10th council meeting. I ask that you seriously tackle these issues in uh, next year's fiscal budget and all become active participants in the process of developing new systems that are truly rooted in community health, safety, and well-being. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Isla. Hello, my name is Isla Bristol and I live and work in Montpelier and I, like many others here today, am here to tell the mayor, the city council, and the city manager that to create a community that truly respects the dignity and humanity of all who live, work, and visit Montpelier, the Montpelier Police Department must be abolished. Systematic racism means that the outcomes of our systems are racist. That means that even if all the individuals within that system are not racist or better yet actively anti-racist, the outcomes of the system would still be racist. This is true of all policing and our entire justice system. We know abolition won't happen overnight. It is a long process we all must go through together as a community. This includes examining why and how police function to begin with and acknowledging that policing has its roots in white supremacy and racism. We must implement new systems of justice, emergency response and conflict resolution. The resolution honoring outgoing Chief Fakos lists such achievements as starting modern initiatives surrounding policing and leading a compassionate approach to policing. We are glad that the council acknowledges the benefits of relying less on armed individuals to respond to calls for assistance from the community. But we will not let the changing of the guard and the appointment of a new chief distract us from the fact that policing itself is rooted in racism and white supremacy. As such, it is harmful to people of color in Montpelier. It is also harmful to people affected by poverty, people struggling with mental illness and many others. We ask now that you actively work towards the goals of creating structures that will eventually take the place of the police department. In the meantime, we will continue to bring the community together to discuss these issues. At the city council meeting on June 10th, a list of demands was communicated that we will now be refining to guide the city's actions towards this goal. We demand the council to take them to heart and act upon them in next fiscal year's budget. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Cameron, do we have anyone else? We do. Um, first off, I just want to apologize if I butchered anyone's name. I'm just trying to read them phonetically, so I do apologize. Um, we have an Ira and Shana Casper. Hey. All right. Uh, Ira, you are up. 
Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I will just uh, keep it pretty short and to the point. Um, so I, I will uh, sort of I don't know, throw my voice into the chorus of uh, the people who are interested in, in the abolition of the police. I, I think that um, there's a lack of uh, uh, creativity uh, in, in, and perhaps a, a great deal, deal of uh, fear of the unknown, but uh, I think the cost is too high um, and we need to be bold uh, in, in our willingness to really um, examine our own role in structural racism. Um, I mainly also just want to emphasize that uh, there's a problem, uh, I think, in a lot of Vermont communities with relying on a, a sense of exceptionalism. Uh, and I think this can be seen in the narrative um, uh, around, uh, you know, we have, uh, we might have good cops as opposed to those bad cops over there. And uh, it's an easy fallback, but it doesn't actually address um, some of the, the fundamental problems, um, nor does it actually speak to the uh, lived experience of a, of a number of uh, black uh, and indigenous and people of color uh, in this state. And so um, I would I would say that um, I think it's, uh, let, me, let, me, let me catch myself here. So I just think that really there needs to be um, some clarity uh, from the leadership in this community about how they stand uh, relating those, those two ideas. Um, some, some clear communication about the intent and desire to address uh, structural racism. And there's a number of people on this call who have put forward themselves as um, leaders, uh, willing to share their, their thoughts and, and their links uh, uh, with you. And so I just want to see um, that reciprocated from um, the city council and the mayor uh, in, in a more formal way. Um, and I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. And I'm, I'm going to save my comments for the end. So um, thank you. Uh, Shana. Hi, everyone. Yeah, my name is Shana Casper. I live on Kent Street, and I'm the chair of the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Council. And I joined that committee about a year and a half ago because I was just sick and tired of people who I loved who lived in Montpelier, who were black and indigenous and people of color, move out of town each year that I, for the six years I've lived here, um, because they didn't see feel safe or welcome. And I really want and uh, wanted and want to change that. Um, and so since joining the committee, um, about half of the issues that have been brought before us were matters related to the Montpelier police. But I um, don't, we haven't like, we're still figuring out what our solutions are and things. And I just want to really share my personal perspective. So not that of um, CJAC of, of dealing with the police. Um, and so I, as I said, I've lived here about six years and I walk and run by myself at night um, with nothing but my cell phone. I go drink at friends' homes and walk home loudly and obnoxiously. And I posted several parties at my house that went later than I told my neighbors they would. So I do a lot of stupid things and not once has the police been called on me. Um, and I've also never dialed 911. I've never had the police come to my home. I've never felt scared or threatened to the point where I considered bringing police into this situation. And I really think that this is how it should be. Um, you know, when, when I um, am out and I feel anxious, I, you know, call up someone or I knock on a door or um, my neighbors, you know, just text me, you know, this is, I really think um, how we should be, you know, taking care of our communities. And, um, you know, the police pulled me over for the first time this winter um, because I had a tail light out. And that experience, you know, gave me the sh like sweaty palms and um, my heart was racing. And I'm actually also a diabetic. So my like could even tell that my blood sugar like spiked from the adrenaline. Um, and, you know, I didn't even get a ticket and that was how like fearful I was. And the, like the worst that I was scared of was just having to pay something that I very easily could have paid. Um, and I just really realized that if that was the fear that I was coming for, for just, um, that like shame of getting a ticket, um, of just what my like black indigenous people of color friends or neighbors, um, must be, um, even more so. And just one of, you know, a litany of reasons of why folks are leaving Montpelier, you know, getting stopped and questioned while out for a walk or out playing, um, while doing their jobs, um, while going to school and seeing Confederate flags, um, you know, dealing with really significant racism every day in so many interactions um, with Montpelierites and with people in power um, as well. 
And right now, you know, we're dealing with COVID and research has shown that the impacts from COVID are hitting those who are already most marginalized um, the hardest. And I know we're going to be seeing really significant budget constraints and cuts. And I want to make sure that those are not taken from places that exist to help and to support those who are already most marginalized and instead to invest even more in those places um, during this you know, time of crisis. And um, it's right now. Ooh, golly. Sorry. Um, so I just want to, I did not, I'm just talking my way through. So yeah, I mean, as Ira said, you know, I think the cost is for inaction is too high. You know, just want to thank everyone for speaking out tonight and that we're really going to need everyone, you know, city councilors, city committees, the police, the public doing a ton of research on policy and a heck of a lot of listening to get good long-term solutions. So I'm sorry I went so long. Okay. Thank you. Um, Cameron, how are we doing? I think that was everyone who raised their hand. If you um, were unable to figure out that um, system and you would still like to speak, um, feel free to unmute yourself and, or raise your hand so we can see you. Oh, no, one, no one else is. I'd like to say something just as a citizen. Okay. We also have a Kaya, Kaya Santana. Oh. And again, I'm sorry if I'm ruining your names. No, you said it right, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, Go for it. Go for it, Kaya. So, hi, my name is uh, Kaya Santana. I live here in uh, Mount Pelia. Um, my family and I, we've lived here for four years now. Um, I do agree with, you know, fun funneling money to other areas within the police force. I do have a concern with um, two things, namely. One, um, it's a, well, both of them kind of pretty much results in safety. One, honestly, I don't feel safe when it comes to crossing in the crosswalks. And if I'm being extremely honest, I would say, especially as a black person here, I have had situations even crossing with my kids where people have just like still just crossed, um, went through the, um, the little flashing lights or whatever like that. I do look forward to having a white person present for when I walk because I have noticed that people definitely stop when someone other than a person of color is in the crosswalk. So perhaps, especially by the shores, if they could put stop signs, a three-way stop sign, I think that would be much more efficient instead of me playing you know, Russian roulette when I'm crossing the street. Um, and I know that sounds extreme, but that's just the honest way that I feel. Um, also, we're from the city, we're from Brooklyn, and um, you, we thought that when we moved here to a much quieter little town, that there would be much more friendly uh, police presence. I haven't seen, I don't know any of the cops. I have never seen them walk around besides maybe going to the shores or something like that, but I live right there on Wildish. Street. I live like behind the senior center in that area. I haven't seen cops walking around. I see them drive around, but not walking to be able to know the people. I have a 16 year old son last summer. I, I call them transients. It seemed like in the summertime, there's transient people that come to the um, city and they, um, you know, I don't know, they just hang around during the summertime. One of them happened to look pretty much like my son. And we was worried that if anything ever happened, my son may be mistaken for this young man. And I feel like if the cops did do walk arounds and kind of got to know the people in the neighborhood a little bit more, we can be less concerned with this mistaken identity because we do have transients that seem to just come when the warmer months come. So I feel like they should have a little bit more familiarity with the residents here in Mount Pelly. I mean, it's pretty small. So more than just driving around, but actually walking around and getting to know people, I would feel much better and safer and knowing that if anything ever happened, at least they know me. And we're more on the friendly terms instead of just them not knowing who I am and thinking I don't belong here because I'm not looking familiar to them. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Over there. Um, okay. Uh, um, was there anybody else? Okay, I'm not seeing anyone else. Oh, John, you were going to say something. Yeah, go for it, John. 
And I'm just saying this as a citizen. I live in District 3, <laughs> St. Paul Street. Um, try to make this quick. Um, look, I, I, historically, I have not been the police department's, any police department's favorite person. I um, came out against tasers here when the police department wanted them. When I was in Green Mountain Daily, uh, we identified a program from the state police collecting prescription information without warrants, and we went out with that, and it was stopped by the end of the week. Even when I got here, I don't know if Chief Fakos will remember, but we started butting heads right away. Um, but right now, I just want to say that since then, um, not only do I respect Chief Fakos and the work he's done, I consider him a friend. Um, and I just hope, and I don't want to make the folks who spoke mad, one in particular, you know who you are. Um, I, I just hope as you know, some of these earnest, meaningful, honest and sincere conversations go forward, that we can please try to have them without implying that the the officers, the current police chief, or the incoming police chief are somehow unwitting dupes of racism. I don't think that's fair. I, I, you know, I've gotten to know the new chief some. I know Tony well. These are good people. And I just hope we can bear that in mind as we go forward. Thanks. Thank you, John. Um, I just want to acknowledge um, and appreciate that a lot of folks um, mentioned, you know, this is a, a long process and um, I think that's, that's going to be true and that's, that's okay. Um, so um, I, I, I mean, I, I certainly, and I think, I think this is probably true for the council. I mean, I think we're all interested in making Montpelier work for all of its residents, um, having it Montpelier work well for all of its uh, residents. And, um, and that means having hard conversations about um, racism and about uh, the structures that we have. And, I, and so I'm fine with having hard conversations. We've, uh, in fact, I actually feel like we have sort of started having um, hard conversations and we're sort of, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that, uh, you know, this um, topic has come up now because it feels like, yeah, I know this, this is, um, this is an, an appropriate conversation to be having. Um, but it's, but it, you're right. It isn't going to be, um, short and, and that's okay. Um, so uh, we are going to be, um, looking further at this, uh, at the topic of, of policing and, and racism, uh, moving on in, into the future. Uh, in fact, I think we may have a, um, well, we'll, we'll I think we have a, a date for that actually. So, um, but we'll we'll be talking more about that um, soon. So, um, you can, yeah, let's let's uh, continue to to be engaged uh, in in these conversations. Um, any other counselors want to say anything? Okay, uh, Lauren. Yeah. Um, just wanted to to say a couple things. I really appreciate that people are showing up and you know continuing to keep a focus on this conversation it's easy to show up to one meeting and then kind of move on to another another topic or venue um you know i'm i'm thinking a lot about you know for for the city um some next steps of you know some data i've seen some really interesting studies of what other city um police departments spend their time on and as we're looking to the future and how funding is spent and again you know i think that is very long-term evolution, but you know, what are we spending our time on? What expertise does that demand? Um, and that kind of analysis. Um, and I think part of that is the, you know, I'm hearing a vision for the future and, you know, really appreciated the the call to be to be bold and visionary and not just do things the way we're doing them because we've always done them that way. Um, so, you know, I look forward to really robust conversations that could challenge how we think, um, you know, and and rooted in what our community needs and what are the the things that are taking time and expertise and that, you know, I do think the disinvestment of many years in social services um, of federal and state government, you know, we, we see the outcome of that, um, you know, and so how can we be as a, as a city and advocating to the state for um, investment in the places our community needs it. So just wanted to 
to share those few thoughts and look forward to the, the ongoing conversation with our, um, our police department, with the council, with community members. Um, and I know uh, Shana from the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee mentioned, you know, we do have this um, contract coming up that is looking at facilitating and convening community conversations. So that could be a space that with some, you know, real expertise and, and helping us have hard conversations um, to that, that that could be um, a helpful thing that the city's already chosen to invest in for this upcoming month. Thanks. Uh, Cameron and uh, yeah, Cameron, then Donna. Yeah. I just wanted to let you know, we had another resident raise their hand, um, Julia Chaffetz would like to speak. Um, oh, Julia, um, Donna, do you want to go yeah, first or do you want to? No, I'll go okay, after. Go That's fine. Okay, go ahead, Julia. Um, I just wanted to uh, respond to what John Odom said and just also talk a little bit broadly about my perspective. Again, having served on the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee for the last two years and just kind of starting to wrap my head around um, how these kinds of conversations and um, policy discussions play out in Montpelier. Um, I think it's really important that we um, that we not focus on individuals, um, and that that really this isn't about individual people being good or bad people. I think most of the people that I come across in this town are good people. I recognize that. Um, and I heard a really good interview um, this past week between uh, Brene Brown and um, shoot, I'm blanking on her name. I'll put it, I'll find a way. Can I send it in a chat? Is there a way to chat? I'll put it in the chat once I find this. Austin Channing Brown, it came back. Um, she talked about, it's not about, we're all good people. It's not about good people. We're all good people. It's about being better people. And it's about being better as a collective. And so we can look at what we have and we can hear about the way that people are harmed by it. And then we can do better. Um, it's not about any, I mean, we're all complicit in the system. I am complicit in this system. We're all part of it. We're all, are also all, raised within it and indoctrinated by it. There's no way to be part of this society without being part of it in some way. Um, so it's not about what, it's not about that. It's about going beyond that. It's about looking at the structures that we have in place that we've inherited, um, that we've all, that we, that many of us have benefited from and, 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 and doing better together. Um, and, and keep keep moving in that direction. So, um, I don't think anybody, I haven't heard anybody slinging individual, um, individual, anything, <laughs> anything at individuals. It's really about how can we all come together? How can we put our, our own fragility away and show up together as a community to make sure that everybody who lives here um, and passes through here is safe and is, um, and more than safe is it can thrive. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Donna. Uh, yes, and uh, Julie, thank you very much for bringing that up because I think that's really important. It goes back to assuming best intentions. And I really appreciate everyone who took the time to speak tonight. I particularly appreciate those who spoke from their personal experience. That's really helpful. And perhaps if you come to future meetings, think about that personal experience or people you know, because that to me is much more helpful than some of the other more blanket uh, statements. So again, thank you all for being here and hopefully we'll keep processing this and working on it and giving it due attention. Yeah. Uh, yes. Could I just ask that one of the group that read the prepared statement send it to us, me, so that we have it for the record and can, you know, as we think about the response they asked for that we have, have it to refer to? So I don't care, one of you can decide or all of you, but uh, last week, a few of you sent me your statements, but it was, seemed like it was all the same statement. So if at least one of you could send it, that would be helpful. Thanks. Great, thank you. Well, thank you everyone. Um, any, anyone else uh, have any comments they wanna make about this? Um, again, um, you know, we're gonna continue to, oh, uh, Cameron, yes. Um, Isla Bristol raised her hand again if you want to allow people to go back through. Um, well, so generally speaking, we um, try not to have people uh, repeat during this time. Is it um, something um, that pertains to anything later in our uh, conversation? No, I just wanted to also echo what Julia said about how it's not about individuals. It's about how we're all affected by the system. and 
I'm a mixed race woman. So I see both sides of it and I've experienced pieces of both sides of it. So it's not about individuals. It's about listening to those that are most oppressed, most marginalized, most marginalized. And because those are the voices that needed to be lifted up the most. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, and I know, um, I'm sure there's a lot more that could be said and, and um, uh, you know, and will be said. So uh, at this point, uh, I think we're gonna move on in the conversation, just acknowledging that. Um, any other comments, uh, Jack? And I, I noticed there's someone else on the screen who raised the, the yellow hand sign identified as iPhone on the screen. I don't know who it is. I think people are using that to react as a, a support. Those are the of claps. Like, yeah. Request. Okay, I couldn't tell. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. They're claps versus raising hand. <laughs> Unless we're wrong, in which case, you know. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, and um, we're gonna uh, continue on here, and you know, look for for um, this being on um, an agenda upcoming. I mean, we so we have. Um, uh, we're going to give our the, the new chief some time, and then we'll be um, in, you know reengaging in these conversations. Um, all right, so uh, so the next thing on our uh, agenda is oh, it's the consent agenda. Is there a motion, uh, Jack? I move the consent agenda. Second. Further discussion. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so the consent agenda passes, uh, and we're on to an appointment for the Conservation Commission. Uh, I believe there was one vacancy and one uh, applicant, uh, and that was Phyllis Rubenstein. Is Phyllis uh, on? Oh, she is. Great. Phyllis, do you want to uh, just quickly introduce yourself and um, tell us about you're just in continuing on this committee. Yes, I'm Phyllis Rubenstein. I live on College Street. I've been on the Montpelier Conservation Commission for a very fast two years, and I'm looking forward to another two years on the commission. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Phyllis? Uh, I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion to appoint, reappoint Phyllis Rubenstein to another term on the Conservation Commission. Second. <laughs> Okay, um, all in favor, oh, any further discussion? Okay, uh, any, um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, well, thank you, Phyllis, for your service and thanks for um, your dedication to continue. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Uh, okay, um, so the next is uh, the Above and Beyond Award uh, for May. So for this, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Bill. We'll turn it over to Cameron. Great. Okay. <laughs> That's fair. Um, so this month for our Above and Beyond Award, we want to recognize Michelle Amaral, who is our, um, she's technically one of our parking attendants but um, she's right now um, helping keep our facilities cleaned and sanitized while our parking fees are not being collected. So she's been really great about being very um, flexible in this time of change. And she has gone far above and beyond um, her call of duty to help us um, really keep our employees safe. And now that we're opening some of our buildings back up to the public, it will be going a long way into keeping our public safe as well. Um, Michelle had multiple nominations. I do want to highlight that. Um, and it, they really called out her extremely positive attitude, her work ethic, and her ability to seek out opportunities to assist others. Um, each of her multiple nominations mentioned specific ways she's gone above and beyond. Um, she has done deep cleaning in buildings that I don't think have seen deep cleaning in 20 years. Um, she painted departments that haven't seen that sort of maintenance in a long time. And it's because, and I think it speaks a lot to how busy our employees are um, that that hasn't gotten done, but Michelle's really gone out of her way to do these things for us. So um, people said that she has a, you know, a can-do attitude, that they're amazed by her work ethic and attitude towards making sure everything is clean and making sure that everyone is safe. 
Um, she takes on a, she took on a job that not a lot of people would have wanted to jump into. And she really um, stepped up and it's really helped us in a time of need for us. And so we really do want to thank her and recognize her, her dedication and commitment to the city and her fellow employees. So thank you, Michelle. Um, I wish she was here to get a round of applause, but um, I'll embarrass her in the hallway next time I see her, I promise. She really has been fabulous. We're not sure we want to put her back out on, on the parking meter. She's been so good at what she's doing, so. Yeah, um, please do pass along to Michelle um, our gratitude. I mean, gosh, so thankful um, for for her stepping up and and you know taking on um, this extra work, really, um, and and exactly like going above and beyond. It's really wonderful. So, uh, anyone else have comments or thoughts on that? Okay. All right. uh, if I could jump in for a minute, I ended up being her uh, new supervisor. Um, and I have to reiterate that she's just has such a positive attitude. She loves working um, in the parking arena and to change jobs um, without a lot of um, personal desire to have the new job that we gave her. Um, and to be such a positive influence and creative about what she's doing and to really look out for the safety and to be concerned for how everybody who's been working in the buildings um, are doing and feeling and making sure that they feel comfortable with everything that she's doing has just been remarkable. I have grown to really appreciate her um, can-do attitude and her support and her um, very forthright comments that um, she shares with me every morning. So um, I'm really excited that um, she was um, given this opportunity to be celebrated. Great. Uh, Donna, yeah. Well, and I also say when and if she's back out on the street, stop and say hi. Great conversation. And she would appreciate being appreciated on the street. <laughs> Great, well, and uh, anyone else? Okay, well, congratulations to Michelle. Uh, job well done. Um, all right, um, so the next uh, item is an honoring of uh, our outgoing police chief, Tony Fakus. Um, there's a, a resolution here. We're so, uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited to um, have this uh, Resolution honoring uh, Chief Vegas. Uh, Bill, do you want to um, talk about this at all? Uh, well, obviously, this will be so. There he is. I was if, uh, this will be his last council meeting, unless we have some kind of a special emergency meeting between now and next Tuesday. So, uh, and I, I think he would have preferred to have missed this one too, but I, I tracked him down and got him to come back and get him to the council <laughs> meeting. Um, but I do, uh, you know, I've obviously uh, have appreciated working with him as police chief and a, a sergeant before that for many years, his dedication to our community, his police department and moving the department forward. And, and you know, even in light of the comments we heard from, from people, I think uh, his heart is, is in many, I think he would agree with many of the comments and sentiments that people had about best serving and making sure that everyone feels safe and his grace uh, and diplomacy, uh, even in these tough conversations, is always evident and has always been. And uh, so I'm, I'm glad the council really uh, wanted to honor him. We were planning to draft something and then heard loud and clear from council members that they wanted to do it too, so it was great. So I'm going to turn this right back over to the mayor, but I just want to personally say thanks to Tony, and I'm going to miss you, and uh, I'm sure we'll see you at Walking Dogs. Yeah, um, I would. Um, I would actually love to read this resolution um, on on your behalf, Tony. Um, if if that's okay with you. Um. Does he have a say? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to read the resolution, and then I have a few just like extra comments um, to make. Um, and I'm sure some other councilors will also want to um, jump in. Uh, so the, the resolution um, for, for 
uh, uh, honoring the police chief, uh, Tony Fakus, upon his retirement. So whereas Anthony Fakus, police chief for the Montpelier Police Department, has retired effective July 1st, 2020, after completing 35 outstanding years of service to the city of Montpelier, and whereas Chief Fakus has, uh, has been a lifelong resident of Montpelier, a graduate of Montpelier High School and Norwich University, with both a bachelor's degree in liberal studies and a master's degree in diplomacy and international studies in 1995 and 2013, respectively. And whereas Chief Fakus began his career with Montpelier Police Department in 1985 at age 20, uh, as a part-time police officer and became a full-time officer with the Montpelier Police Department in 1987. And whereas Chief Fakus was one of Montpelier Police Department's original bike patrol officers in the early 1990s and was promoted to position of sergeant in 1997. And whereas Chief Fakus attended the Babson College Command Training Program, the FBI Hostage Negotiators Training, and Leadership in Police Organizations trainings based on national best practices for modern police organizations. And whereas Chief Fakus graduated the FBI's National Academy for Law Enforcement Officers in 2004, and whereas Chief Fakus served as the Montpelier Police, or Chief of Police from 2007 to 2000, uh, <laughs> 20, <laughs> and whereas Chief Fakus revamped department policies and procedures to reflect evolving trends in, and modern initiatives surrounding policing while making officer training a priority for Montpelier Police Department, and whereas Chief Fakus established Project Safe Catch for Montpelier Police Department in partnership with the Central Vermont Substance Abuse Services and CVH to assist those with substance abuse to find help and connections rather than incarceration. And whereas Chief Fakus was instrumental in developing a partnership with Washington County Mental Health to form the Team Two approach for ensuring a joint response of police and mental health screeners to address mental health calls for service that later became the statewide best practice model. And whereas Chief Fakus presented at the International Chiefs of Police National conference along with Washington County Mental Health on the Team 2 approach with a national law enforcement audience. And whereas Chief Fakus fostered and developed relationships with multiple federal agencies, including the FBI, DEA, and ATF, which directly assisted Montpelier and Central Vermont communities in dealing with a wide range of law enforcement issues. And whereas Chief Fakus has been an advocate for treating people like whole individuals working to protect and serve people who are vulnerable in our community. And whereas Chief Fakus has led the department with a compassionate approach to policing and that we appreciate his dedication to the six pillars laid out in the president's report on 21st century policing. And whereas Chief Fakus frequently volunteered to provide testimony and expertise to the Vermont legislature concerning police related statutory governance and proposed changes. And whereas Chief Fakus has spent a lifetime upholding the safety of Montpelier residents and serving the community by ensuring that the Montpelier Police Department is a servant of the people and is responsive, fair, and thoughtful in its work. And whereas Chief Fakus has been a strong and compassionate voice for 21st century policing practices and has worked to make the Montpelier Police Department a model of such practices. And now therefore be it resolved that the Montpelier City Council does hereby commend and thank Chief Anthony Fagus for many years of dedicated law enforcement service, and especially for his positive and invaluable contributions to the Montpelier Police Department and the Montpelier community at large, and wishes him a healthy and enjoyable retirement. Yay. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor, uh, City Council and Bill and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, and the Montpelier community and the men and women of the Montpelier Police Department. Um, it's been the greatest honor of my life to lead this department and do my part to make this little part of Vermont that much better for everyone. So but thank you so much for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just want to add to um, you know, it's, I think it's so evident in that resolution, it's come up multiple times in that resolution that you have led with compassion and uh, that you've really led us well and you've led by example. 
and uh, that that your compassion and um, dedication to to protecting people, to making Montpelier work for everyone, has uh, really it's truly been evident um, in your time. And we're so I've been personally grateful to work with you. Um, and um, you know, best best wishes for you in your retirement. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Um, anyone else want to add anything? Uh, Connor, go ahead. Yeah, no, Chief. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think I knew what to think of the department before I got in council and got the look under the hood. Uh, but as we talk about this national conversation, um, I realize that a lot of the reforms uh, we're talking about shifting to, you've already been a leader on, um, acknowledging that somebody with a badge isn't not necessarily the best person to respond to a call. You went up to the legislature and advocated for a social worker. Um, when we, we saw that homelessness w was an issue in Montpelier and we needed to do something to address it, you and your department bring people uh, from the homeless community into the council chambers to tell their story, even, even if they were <laughs> criticizing you in some cases, and that's really appreciated. Um, you know, you, you've lived and worked in Montpelier. Um, I think you have your, your thumb on the pulse of the town. And uh, now I'm just, uh, I'm grateful to have worked with you and to, to know you. So thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Donna. Uh, and I would like to add to that, Tony, is that you're just so personable and you come and you educate us. Uh, you're willing to, to take what we don't know and bring us up to an, our awareness, not only within the police department, but things about our community we don't know. So I just think you're just extraordinary. And I'm looking forward, as I said to you earlier yesterday, Bar Hill is going to open. We are going to toast you. <laughs> No. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, Tony. Thank you. Uh, Dan. So uh, I'll, I'll add to the other counselors um, laudations and kudos, uh, but I, you know, I have only been on the council uh, a few months, but I know we've dealt with each other in, in other circumstances in my professional career. Uh, and I'd simply add that, you know, we are very fortunate to have had you here in Montpelier. Um, it is not every town or city in Vermont that has the kind of leadership that you bring um, that makes a department for a relatively small town, you know, the kind of model of professionalism, of progressive thought and policing um, that you've come to embody. And I have seen a lot of police departments with a lot of problems. And, you know, we heard a lot of people talking earlier and, you know, those problems are real. And there are a lot of towns that deal with those. And, you know, um, I think Montpelier has been very fortunate in that, you know, they had leadership that has sought to address these issues and it's been your leadership. And I think, um, you know, we, um, it's, it's often easy to lose focus when you live um, in the bubble of Montpelier um, but having looked at other, other departments, other towns, representing people suing police departments and representing police departments, um, I, I, I can say with a degree of objectivity um, that you have been a fantastic resource for Montpelier uh, and a great leader. And uh, we're sorry to see you go. We're happy to see Brian. But tonight's your night. Congratulations, Tony. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Jack. Well, one thing we haven't moved to pass this resolution yet, so we should. Uh, so, <clears throat> I'll I'll move that we adopt that resolution. Second. <laughs> I'll second it. Got a couple uh, seconds. Let us <laughs> all second it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the um, other thing I would say is that as we as we look at conflicts between police and communities across the country, a lot of what we see is situations where the uh, it's very adversarial. The police uh, see themselves or are seen as the, the warrior policeman model and see themselves as being something separate from the, uh, the community. And uh, the leadership that Tony has brought and the uh, presence of the entire police department 
shows that they're part of the community, they're working with the community, and that's uh, what I think Tony deserves a lot of credit for that. And uh, it's it's why we are where lots of other places would love to be where we are with our police department here in Montpelier. So thank you, Tony. Good luck. Uh, condolences, as people know, I always, always offer condolences to people when they're retiring. <laughs> It's been great having you. Thank you, Jack. Jay. I, I just want to um, quickly echo what all the other counselors have said, but then also um, just point out one one particular thing. Tony, uh, as we've worked together over the years, it's usually been around um, issues related to the schools and uh, a focus on safety of, of the children in our school system. And I just want to acknowledge um, uh, the community and generational approach that you took um, to Montpelier. Um, it, you were proactive in making sure you were, you and your department were supportive of, of all the people in the community of Montpelier, um, young and old alike. And I just think that that should be acknowledged as well. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate that, Jay. Thank you. Uh, Lauren. Um, I think so much has already been said. I just wanted to echo my appreciation and my time. My always to be to think through salute when I was working on the um, resolution just last meeting in main police brutality I worked with Tony on that he agreed with you know he kind of gave his blessing to the language that was in there so um, you know for everyone really interested in these ongoing conversations about how we are doing better just I think that that would embody the vision that he has brought to our police force and the kind of future we want to, you know, continue to do better and better at. And so I just really appreciate um, the, the opportunity to, to work with you and, you know, what a, what a legacy you're leaving for our community. So thank you and all the best in retirement. Thanks. Lauren. Great. Uh, um, Speech time. Speech chief. <laughs> Speech. Uh, <no. laughs> well, wait a minute, don't we need to vote? On the road. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, you better be sure it passes before you say anything. <laughs> um, great. Well, so we have a motion and a second. Um, any further discussion? Okay. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Great. Um, resolution passes. Uh, th <laughs> thank you, Tony. Would you like to say anything more? I just want to say, just addressing everybody again, uh, thank you, but it's this community that has really uh, helped shape the Montpelier Police Department to to how we approach taking care of our community in our role. And, you know, in, in, in right now we're in a historic period. Um, do not know what the future holds, but we do know that collaboratively we're going to improve systems at every everywhere we can. And I don't know what it's going to look like ultimately. And, uh, you know, Brian is going to be the, soon to be the new skipper that will lead us through uh, with a lot of all other fresh perspectives and ideas. And I really look forward to seeing that. But I just want to say thank you to, to, you know, to the department and to this community. Great. Well, and thank you for helping to lead or uh, to lay that really healthy uh, foundation for us um, to build off of. I'm really grateful. Um, Okay, well, so there, I, I guess we've, we've passed uh, our motion. Any, any further comments? I'll just follow up on what Donna said. Um, you know, Tony, we'll have our, you know, we have had, we will have our, our private conversations, but you really do deserve a big public thank you and send off. And it's really unfortunate that we're in this time when those kind of events can't happen. But when they can, we're not going to forget you. So, um, <laughs> Don't don't stray too far because we're going to track you down and um, and I know uh, life cell number so you're in trouble. I'm sticking around. <laughs> good, good. I also look forward to being able to cheer you properly. So, um, okay. Um, uh, any any further comments? Okay. All right. We're going to move on then. Um, thank you. Thank you again, Tony. Uh, all right, so we have another thanks uh, to uh, the CAN Network volunteer. Um, so uh, for this, um, I might, I suppose I'm turning things over to, oh, Cameron, okay, great. 
I figured we'd just skip Bill turning it to me. So thank you. That's good. <laughs> so, um, Elizabeth Parker um, from Sustainable Montpelier has helped with this. And this is um, a general thank you to um, those who have been volunteers during the COVID um, stay in place order and the general emergency that we find ourselves in. So if it's all right with you, I'd like to read the thank you. So we, the city of Montpelier and the Montpelier community would like to honor the countless volunteers who've stepped up during the COVID-19 emergency. Community volunteers have taken shifts at the Regional 211 Center in the Washington North Orange County Regional Resource Command Center, if you remember Winock Rock. And volunteers have shopped for vulnerable individuals through Montpelier Mutual Aid. Additionally, volunteers stepped up to coordinate restarting the capital area neighborhoods to develop ongoing communication neighbor to neighbor and to build an ongoing community in the face of the coronavirus and beyond. Volunteers have also worked with Montpelier Alive to support our local businesses. And we also wanna thank everyone who's been shopping locally online and through other pick up and to go services. Our community's volunteers have also helped feed our community by reinvent, reinventing the community church lunches as brown bag meals, by helping make deliveries to the Senior Center Feast to Go program, by organizing lunches for school children, helping organize food boxes at Just Basics, and by setting up neighborhood food shelves. Community volunteers have also helped by making calls to ask folks just how they're doing, and by reaching out to neighbors to offer assistance and by going above and beyond to help in numerous ways still yet to be seen. The Montpelier community values volunteering and their efforts have gone a long way in getting Montpelier ready to respond to community needs in the face of COVID-19 and ensuring that residents are healthy, safe, and cared for. Thank you again to everyone who has volunteered during this time. Your generosity has lifted us all up and continues to do so. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I want to add my my own addition to that. Thank you so much to the uh, those who have volunteered with the uh, CAN networks and um, and for your continued volunteering. Um, uh, we look forward to uh, you know further uh, seeing how that network develops. So um, really grateful for for everyone who stepped up during this time. Um, anyone else want to add anything? Um, I have uh, Laura Byron is, uh, Brooke, sorry, uh, is here, and I just thought I'd, I'd let her speak for a moment about um, about where Can is right now. <laughs> okay, uh, go ahead, Laura. Sure. Hi, everybody. Laura Brooke, uh, formerly Byron. I'm still getting used to it too. Um, well, I wanted to just share in the appreciation for all of the volunteerism that's happened through through all the things that Cameron was talking about, um, but capital area neighborhoods and mutual aid network uh, specifically. Um, we had countless hours of time trying to spend figuring out, well, what is my neighborhood? Like, you know, how many households can I cover? And um, getting the flyers out in order to share resources with all of the neighbors and checking in on folks during a challenging time. So it's been really an honor for me to, to work with everybody and to see such um, passion and care. Um, and I, I also look forward to seeing how the, the network can grow and sustain itself over the months and the years to come. Um, we are working on getting Capital Area Neighborhood t-shirts um, that'll be available for coordinators and counselors, which will be fun. Um, and other projects, we're trying to work on getting some sandwich boards up and around for neighborhoods that think that that could be a cool resource for folks. They can post, you know, notices and events. And um, yeah, there's a there's a can-do attitude that we've been feeling from a number of neighborhoods. So it's been it's been fun. It's been inspiring, um, and I look forward to continuing to help. Thanks. And. Thank you, uh, Laura and Elizabeth, for your work in this as well. Uh, Connor. I, I just wanted to say, like, what you did was real organizing. Like, people were scared. Anybody can take out an ad in the paper, send a round of emails. Um, but it meant a lot to people, I know, in my neighborhood, just getting an actual flyer on their door with that list of resources. And I think they felt very supported. And 
it was really thinking outside the box that reinvented of this. So just want to thank you, Sustainable Montpelier, everybody who did this so much for your work. Uh, Lauren. Yeah, I just wanted to echo my appreciation. And, you know, we're still in this crisis, which is ongoing and, you know, the effects we could be feeling for years. So having this structure created and all of the groundwork that um, you all leadership with uh, Sustainable Montpelier and then also the community members is so great. And, you know, we know with the climate crisis and other pending things that just having this um, built and something to continue to grow is just really impactful. And so just really appreciate it. Um, and else? Okay. Um, all right. So with um, this uh, item, I don't think there was anything that we needed to approve or anything. Um, but uh, we are, but we're certainly grateful for all the work of uh, Sustainable Montpelier Coalition, as well as all the volunteers um, who stepped up to help neighbors. Uh, great. So we're going to move on um to uh the flag policy um so for this i'm not sure if i'm turning it over either to to bill or to dan um either either of you want to pick this up uh well i'm gonna i'm gonna slide it to dan really fast but i'll just say uh you know at your last meeting we had the conversation or actually at our special meeting about putting the flag up and painting the mural uh, we have ordered a flag it's not we're not waiting for this policy to put it up it just hasn't arrived yet and um, so we as staff had started drafting a policy based on uh, the, the conversation. And then uh, during a regular call with Dan, he had uh, he told me that he had started working on one. So we sent the thoughts we had to him and he put it all together. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dan. Thanks, Bill. Um, so this came up, I think, uh, you know, when we approved the, the Black Lives Matter flag uh, to be flown at City Hall, I think there was a question, and, and Bill may have raised it, but I, it was certainly was in my mind, which is, you know, do we have a policy for how long the flag would fly or, um, you know, how, how we make these decisions as a type of ongoing question and framework, and we really didn't. And, you know, if I, I think if you don't have a policy like this in place, then it can feel like um, a, a discretion and can cause either hard feelings or difficult choices if, you know, it's not sort of, this is our policy, this is our tradition, this is what we follow for these kind of things. And so the intent of this policy is not really to reinvent the wheel uh, on how to fly a flag. Um, it adopts both the federal, uh, the U.S. flag code and the Vermont uh, flag protocol, both of which are in, in statutory language. Um, it just says that, you know, for the city of Montpelier and its buildings, this is how we'll do it. And we'll follow the flag code um, and, and the state flag laws. Um, but then it has under guidance under subsection B, it has the display of additional flags indoors or outdoors. And so it talks about special flags, which would be anything other than say like the United States flag, the state of Vermont flag, the flag of Montpelier. Um, these would be flags that, you know, we want to fly for a variety of reasons um, and tries to give some guidance and framework to it. Um, what it would say is that, you know, city hall is the place where this should happen. Um, you know, and that's when we talk about flying special flags, we're not talking about flying a special flag at every single city building, whether it be the police department, the um, water treatment plant, or um, the sewer septic treatment plant. Let's let's focus it on city hall. You know, flags and banners may only be displayed upon the issuance of a federal or state proclamation, council resolution, or mayoral proclamation and by receiving approval from the Montpelier City Council. So it just puts it in our hands as to how we would display these type of special flags. It then gives examples of special flags or banners, including sister city flags, heritage flags, um, you know, flags received in recognition of awards, flag received from visiting groups, flags designating an event or accomplishment. Um, and it says, you know, that we have to, as mayor and city council would uh, make this approval. And then and it also goes on to when selecting or approving a request for a special, flying a special flag, the mayor and council shall make the 
shall consider and make a determination that the special flag meets at least one or more of the following criteria. And that lays out about um, six criteria that it, they're just ideas for how we would um, fly these flags. So for example, you know, whether the United States or state of Vermont has recognized the flag through statute or proclamation, whether the flag represents an organization dedicated to the public good for the citizens of Montpelier, whether the flag represents a national state or, or city interest, whether the flag is a historic American flag that continues to have a primary positive message of American history and unity, whether the flag promotes unity and community with another city state, whether a flag represents a positive interest or value worthy of public recognition. So it just simply tried to create, you know, very broad general criteria, not intending to handcuff us or to, to you know, force us into certain categories, but to think about that and, and, and think about that process as we're going through, um, you know, and, and, and a good example, I, I thought is something like the Gaston flag, um, you know, which is a historic American flag, but it's come to symbolize a very particular political element um, with it. So it may not carry the same sort of historic message. And if somebody came and said, I want to fly it for the, you know, historic purpose, we could say, well, it's not really the same message as before. And, and even more, you know, sort of not that this would has ever necessarily happened, but, you know, something, you know, somebody wants to fly, a, you know, a, a Confederate flag. I, you know, that's a historic flag, but it does not carry the positive message that if it ever did. Um, and it would give the council those tools to make those analysis and decisions. So it then puts a time limit on, we fly it for 30 days, unless the council decides we want to do it for longer. Um, but setting 30 is sort of the default for these special flags. Um, some of this is sort of flag code, um, geekery, which is, you know, you can't have special flags bigger than the United States or state of Vermont flag. Um, then, um, this is one of the things that I added and, um, you know, I, it's a small thing, but I think it's, it's sort of a sign of respect for people that, you know, dedicate themselves to public service, which is, you know, there is a whole protocol as to when flags are flown at half staff. And, you know, on the federal level, it's when the president, ex-president, or president-elect dies, or when the sitting vice president, chief justice, or retired chief justice, or speaker of the house, you know, should die. Um, and then you have the state level. And I thought, why not add a why not add a city level to this? So, you know, if the mayor, ex-mayor, or mayor-elect should pass away, um, we would fly the flag at half staff uh, because being mayor, you know, doesn't come with the big payroll. Why not get a half flag? Um, you know, uh, uh, as a sign of, of respect, you know, current members of city council kind of reflecting both the state and federal level, um, and then other, other designated local officials. So if somebody important, somebody who's, who's dedicated a great deal of resources or time or, you know, talent to the city, you know, should, should pass away, it would be a nice way to show respect um, on it as an official gesture, which, you know, um, I think is is worthwhile. Um, it has a couple of other, and then finally, I think this is a really important one. If nothing else, I think this is probably one of the most important ones, which is, you know, any instance where a city of Montpelier employee is killed in the line of duty or dies as a direct result of injuries incurred while performance of official duties, you know, I think it, we should have it as a policy that that person or persons should be given that sign of respect. Um, and so, not that any of these things were not possible before adopting this flag policy, but w why not have this um, as sort of a go-to so we don't have to think about it? Because these are the kind of things that are not really things you necessarily want to or have to think about, but that way you have a policy and it, it, it falls to that default and it helps shape the decisions. But that's that's it in the gist. Um, I'm happy to um, you know talk further, but that's... Not much else I can say. Well, I want to thank you so much, Dan, for uh, your work and also for city staff's uh, work on putting this together. Um, and uh, it's, I, I think the the additions there are nice. You know, uh, I mean, I, I'll acknowledge like, oh, that's a nice shout out as the mayor. <laughs> don't, I don't plan on dying anytime soon. Uh, but, you know, for, for previous mayors, I think that would be, you know, that, that would be very uh, very nice. Um, as well as, uh, you know, for anyone, uh, you know, um, 
people killed in the line of duty, people who, um, uh, uh, yeah, just other folks who have dedicated a lot of time to the city. I think that makes, uh, I think that make, makes a lot of sense. Um, other um, uh, thoughts, ideas, comments? Oh, goodness, lots of people. I saw uh, Jay, then Donna, then Jack. Go ahead. Yep, I just have one quick question. Um, and Dan, I appreciate the work and the, the geekery um, and, and staff work on on putting this putting this all together. It's very comprehensive. I'm curious about the 30 day time frame. Um, I know that I wonder if we might want to build in a little bit of flexibility. That I agree that there should be a time limit um, that it shouldn't exceed a certain amount of time. Um, but I wonder if we might want to build in a little bit of flexibility so that um, it, it doesn't have to come up every other meeting if the council does want to keep the flag up. Um, you know, I think that, you know, Bill brought up the Olympic flag that flew when Amanda Pelkey was competing. And so, that, you know, that was sort of a real discreet time. It made sense to have it flying during the time of the Olympics. But I wonder, what, you know, something like the Black Lives Matter, is that something that, do, does the council want to have the discretion to, in one vote, say maybe up to 90 days as opposed to 30? Um, it's, I don't know what's sure. best practice. I just wanted to, just, just curious your thoughts on it. Well, I, uh, just in quick response to that, Jay, I, I think the way the language is shaped, we have that authority to do that. It says, unless otherwise stated by the count by the mayor and approved by the city council, you know, it would be for 30 days. So, you know, for example, if we decided to fly the flag of Switzerland because they had been really nice to us uh, and we wanted to do it for 60 days, um, I think we would be able to do that um, just by the initial approval or a subsequent approval if we felt, you know, after 60 days, we still really want to have that Swiss flag flying. Um, so I think there's there's flexibility here and it's really not intended, at least in my mind, um, to, to limit exactly what you're getting at, um, where somebody feels, you know, 30 days doesn't cut it or 30 days is too much. Let's. Okay, that sounds good, thank you. Sure. Um, Donna. Say me? Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Dan and staff. It's great to have such detail. I do have a question about the mayor and wondered if some of your examples came from a more mayor-driven organization. And uh, like it says, I have marked in six places. And the first one is under purpose must be approved by mayor and the full Montpelier City Council. Does that mean unanimous? Uh, no, I think it's just that the full council would it have to go to the council for for a quorum. And and you're right, you know, some of this language did come out of um, you know, I borrowed from from other cities that had um, had some of this phrasing, but I also I was conscious about putting the mayor sort of at the center. In, in part, uh, Bill told a story to me about um, a flag issue that had arisen that was an accidental um, issue a number of years ago where uh, flags were put up and on, on banners that were, um, but there was no date to sort of remove them. Um, and the city council, you know, voted to remove them and caused a public stir and the mayor basically stepped in and said, no, I'm, I'm asserting my authority. And I think this is under, was under Chuck Carpassus. Um, and so, you know, it's- Mayor Caparis vetoed the vote of the council to take- I'm sorry, Carp um, Yeah, so I mean, it was just one of those he things I think- it, it was The mayor can veto the vote of the council. Well, yeah. I didn't know that pa power and- Yeah, <laughs> okay. it's been in the charter forever. Well, well there you know, we just had very modest mayors. <laughs> So, that's, so I guess I still, I don't, I sort of object to all of a sudden putting the full in there on that sure. line. Um, so and, I, and I can weigh line. in, I'd like to weigh in on that just quickly, Donna, because I actually did suggest to Dan, in part because um, sometimes something might happen where, you know, so, that we should do something, whether it's put a flag up or take a flag down or something, and we may not be able to get the council together and it, in fact, Dan had actually suggested that the city manager could do this. And I said, you know, it really should be the, the elected official that represents the whole city. That this, if it's a if it's a policy political statement, even if it's just in the interim, you know, we want to fly this at half mass because some notable resident 
passed away. And the mayor says, you know, yeah, we ought to do this. It was just, and, and that actually was what, what the outcome of that conversation was back, uh, I think it was the be- early 2000s at the beginning of the Iraq war. And the council then said, you know what, we're just leaving flag decisions to the mayor. We think, you know, otherwise they get too politicized, they get too, you know, wrapped up in debate and that kind of thing. So I offered him that example. I'm not, I just want you to know that's where it came from. Well, well, I mean, I guess I have to go back to understanding more about the veto. So if the mayor vetoes it, even if the council is unanimous, they can't override that veto? Yes, the mayor, the council can. Um, it's all it's all on the charter. The mayor can override any vote of the council, uh, can veto any vote of the council, and five of the six can override it. Okay, I mean, that's what, I, okay, I understood that you could veto it, but I didn't think it was like final the way I heard it the first time you said it. So no, it, what happened not, was in that case, the mayor vetoed it, and the council was like, yeah, that was a good solution. Like that, that got us yeah. all off the hook. Okay. But so, you still have the typical, if the enough numbers can override a veto. Yeah, oh yeah. It's just that I guess I feel like it's, it's so much better if it's a group process. And like here on number, under guidance B, it says additional displays of flag. It says it can be federal or state proclamation, council revolution, or a mayoral proclamation and by approval. So the council still approves it. It's not just, I just feel when one person makes a decision to fly a flag, to make a proclamation as such, it's not as solid in the community as if it has the support of the city council too. I, I think that's fine. I, um, so I, I just need to yeah. understand that reading, you know, whether it's, this and this, a mayor can proclamation does or does not need the city council? Well, if, I mean, if you want to tie it to that, Donna, we, you know, I think. Well, we, okay, we so what it reads now though, I'm reading it right, it doesn't tie it to it, it stands alone. Yeah, not necessarily. Um, I mean, it's, you know, it's a little bit, it's, it's a little bit ambiguous because of, it says council resolution or mayoral proclamation. Um, and, you know, at least, um, the, well, it, it could be read as, you know, any of these would be a triggering event such as a federal or state proclamation, council resolution, or a mayoral proclamation, and then by receiving approval from the Montpelier City Council as to any of those three triggering events. But, you know, we could certainly clarify, um, that language, um, and just simply have it be, um, you know, by a city council re- resolution and just simply make it, um, you know, any time. I guess I'd ask, I'd throw it to Bill. Uh, Bill, how often do we get any type of like sort of direct, I know Jim Condo, so at the Secretary of State's office will often say, you know, fly your, ma- fly your flags at half mast because, you know, Justice Gibson just passed away or you know, by proclamation of the governor, this, that's not something we then have to vote on as a city council. No, because that's the state flag and the same with when the, if the, you know, the president can declare when federal flags are flown at half mast. And so, you know, part of it is that analogy that the president makes the call for the federal flag, the governor makes the call for the state flag. So should the mayor make the call for the city flag? Um, that's, I think that's different than choosing to put up a special flag. Um, you know, the, the choice to put a, f- a flag at half mast to honor somebody is different. Right. Than we, the council as a group, is saying we're going to put up the Black Lives Matter flag or any of these other. other so, we could, so those should maybe be differentiated there um, in terms of the role. I'm just putting someone in as a mayor who is like some of the people who recently got elected, who I wouldn't want to have the absolute power to do things like this. <laughs> So I mean, one I thing the was, worst case scenario in this language bothers me. <laughs> and, and it's like do what you want. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I think it just should be simple and and straightforward. And and so um, you know, I can we can certainly change. And I think it's it's B one that really you know um, section four subsection B little i really talks about um, you know special flags. And we could change that language that says flag and banners may only be displayed upon 
and we could just simply cut out that issuance of federal state proclamation, council resolution, or mayoral proclamation, and we could just simply say, um, shall only be displayed upon the approval of the Montpelier City Council and mayor. Um, well, right, so then my question was the mayor votes, she I mean, the mayor sometimes does, sometimes doesn't. So okay. and by separating the mayor suddenly from the city council, it changes a different voting mechanism, does it not? No, the mayor, the mayor, the, the, the charter is pretty really clear about this, that the city council consists of the mayor and the city council members. Oh, well, that's why I thought that all this language and, separates the two. And sometimes we refer to as mayor and council, and sometimes we just say the city council, but it really all means the same thing. And, you know, the, the, the practice of the mayor not voting is really a practice. The, the charter doesn't actually prohibit it. By tradition and the council's rules of business, the mayor votes to make a fourth vote or break a tie. But there's no right. They can vote any time. issue if they want it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you know one of the issues again that came up was say we had let's use Amanda Pelkey just as an example. You know in that case we put it up while she was in the Olympics. But say a former Olympian was going to, suddenly we found out that some Olympian was going to come to town and we're only going to be here for a day. And so the mayor might say, Hey, let's fly the Olympic flag that day while, you know, this person's in town, you know, you know, to honor them. And it may be without the ability to have a council vote. And so I think part of it was just to have those flexibility kind of things. But again, it's your policy. You can, you as a group should just decide what you want to do. I don't think there's any. Yeah, I I think changing the languages that, that I proposed, I think might go to Donna's question. But Bill, I think it's still that that there's in that subsection. Um, it's uh, B I four says the mayor has the discretion to fly an appropriate flag for a single day if a public right. purpose is served by Yeah, I, I saw that, but it, that to me seemed to be counter to the point that Donna was raising, so. Right, but I think that would stay there. That seems to be like that special occasion where you've got like one, you know, a one day kind of thing where somebody comes in or, you know, there is that sort of need where the council's not gonna be there. So the mayor can make that sort of judgment call uh, for a single day. Um, but that normally the normal process is that, you know, it comes before city council for review and approval. Um, and we could just simplify it and, and Donna, I'm happy to just have it be the city council so that we don't get into any confusion as to, um, you know, whether it's the mayor or city council, we'll just simply put, you know, get, get rid of that extra, extra language and just really focus it on having the city council approve the flying of special flags, and then that subsection four carves out that sort of one day exception should a mayor want to. That works. I would feel better, but that's yeah. fine. Thank you. Fine. Mm -hmm. um, other comments? Uh, Jack. Thank you. I was wondering if instead, you know, we could send this back to Dan to uh, work on again. Or the other thing that occurred to me is to address the point that Donna raised in uh, section 4B, Roman numeral one, we might amend, amend this just to, at the end of the first sentence, after the word city hall, to say, on vote of the city council, period, and then delete the rest of that, uh, delete the next sentence. And I think that would do what we're getting at. I'm, I'm comfortable with that language that Jack's proposing, because I think that's, it's basically what I'm proposing is more elegant. Um, so I'm... Okay. Don, does that work for you? I think you're on mute still. Uh, uh, yes, I guess I'll see the full draft. I had six places that the mayor came up that I just had questions about. So it probably will address it. Okay. Uh, well, are there other things you want to um, bring up there, Donna? Uh, 
I mean, do you want me to name? I mean, there's just six places that the mayor comes up with some authorized by the mayor, mayoral proclamation stated by the mayor. Um, so I can send the the points to Dan in case he missed them. And then at the very end, number two, at the direction of the president, governor, or mayor. So like you would be deciding who's at half mat, who gets half mass outside of those that are listed? You, well, not you, the mayor would. Yeah, I mean, I, that, that goes back to what I was talking about with Bill earlier, which is that sometimes that is time sensitive. Um, you know, oh, I see. Okay. Right. And I think that's different than choosing. It wouldn't be choosing a special flag to fly at half mast. It would be just choosing when to put flags at half mast, which, uh, you know, again, and it I would only be the city flag. Mm -hmm. yeah, was, we can't okay. put the other flags at half mast. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. So, um, uh, Donna, does it make more sense to you to send the other piece, like places to Donna and then have us revisit this? Or do you want to, um, or uh, is there, are there other thoughts from other folks uh, about, about all this? Yes, Jack. One other thing about on the point about uh, display of flags that have staff. C1 says the flag shall be shown four and a half staff for a period to be prescribed under the following circumstances. And then it doesn't say what the period is. And I think that there's at the federal level and maybe at the state level, there's a certain standard practice. And uh, so I don't know how we would address that. But again, since the half staff thing, it seems like we're trying to make it the self-effectuating or automatic uh, indicating what the period of time would be in the resolution or in the policy seems to make sense. I can, yeah, I can, I can add sort of a standard, just look to see what both the federal and state and just model it off of that. Um, and just add, I can add language. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take it back and, and make these two changes and then bring it back up in July. Um, if those are the only changes. That, sound, that sounds fine to me. I mean, I understand the time sensitive piece, but um, beyond that, uh, I mean, generally, I think I, I agree with Donna. There's not necessarily, like I have, uh, besides facilitating the council, um, you know, I think of myself as part of the council. Um, so um, uh, unless there's a, uh, but again, you know, unless there's a reason like, you know, it's time sensitive and I think that makes sense. Um, so um, any other thoughts on this? Okay. All right. Well, and thank you again, uh, Dan, for all your work on this. Um, it really is great. And I, I think we'll, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll take that up again in July. Does that sound about right team? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. Um, okay. Um, so it, I want to acknowledge that it is 820 right now. Um, would folks like to take a, a break? I suggest yes. Okay. All right. Um, so we're going to take uh, uh, just about a, is five minutes okay? Five minutes is all right? Okay. So uh, so we'll take a five minute break and be back at about 8.25 and uh, we'll go from there. All right. Thanks. And um, so the next item is uh, uh, just uh, revisiting the um, uh, COVID-19 budget adjustment. And we had taken this up, um, I think, to um, hear particularly from Montpelier Live or the Montpelier Development Corporation. I don't see... Anyone on here from either of those organizations? Am I? Is, does anyone have any information to the contrary there? No, um, we did reach out to the folks that were involved. Montpelier Live, as you recall, did not have reduced funding. Um, oh, were, that's right. Thank you. Um, but we did let the other eight folks know, and they've indicated that they would not have people here at this meeting. They said they understood and, you know, obviously wished it weren't happening, but they understand the reasons why and that, 
we're making reductions across the board, including to city operations. Um, so, so we did not, as you know, just to remind everyone, there were no reductions in any of the funds to community service agencies, nonprofit agencies dealing with mental health and those things. There were um, no reductions to Montpelier Alive. So. Okay. Um, the way I want to sort of organize this time is see if there's any clarifying questions from council. Um, and then if there are folks from the public that want to speak, then um, we'll, we'll hear from them and then we'll um, uh, revisit our, our conversation. So um, any clarifying questions from council? Uh, Donna and um, then Laura. Dan Grover um, mentioned last time that the July 4th money or third money that Montpelier Live was hoping to apply that to another event. Did he ever give more information on that specifically of what event they were planning? They were hoping to do something in the fall, uh, but you know, still not sure whether that's going to be feasible. And okay, there's no reason why we can't look at our budget at that time. You know, it's forty five hundred dollars. It's not one of the big reductions. Um, so you know, we can take a look at that in. September or October, if they, if they think it's going to be feasible and where we stand with revenues. But okay, good. good. Donna, just just, just to, so you understand, they were planning on taking that. You know, in uh, October, they do the uh, Moonlight Madness event, which is you know just promoting a, a you know a Saturday. It's typically, like it's either a Friday night or a Saturday evening sale, and a lot of local businesses are involved. They were looking at um, making it more of a weekend event you know, ho hoping things were opened up a little bit more and look at some more activities and programming to help make it more of a sort of downtown business promotion throughout the weekend, not just a one evening type of thing to rally people to come downtown. So that's where they were gonna divert those funds. Thank you. Um, Lauren, oh, and, and then uh, Connor. Um one question I had, um, and thank you for all the work going into this. This is really impressive to, to get where you are. So thank you, Kelly and the finance team and um, city manager's office. Um, just knowing that there's been a lot of state conversations around homelessness and money that's been going from, like that was one of the areas where some of the CARES funding was able to go into. And I assume that's kind of part of the analysis here. So there is a proposed reduction. There have been new services and opportunities available. There's also, you know, we can't use the system that we've used of, of shelters, um, you know, likely this year. So just any, if there's any update or more information on that piece, you know, could, could more of that money potentially be coming from the state to help support our efforts to um, support our uh, population experiencing homelessness, or is it just too early to no, it's a little too early to tell, but I do know I have talked with the homeless advocates and I believe there are some pretty major initiatives afoot. They have to move pretty quickly. Uh, one of the downsides is they have to have this money sort of rolled, you know, committed by sort of September and used up or, you know, done by December. Um, so there's this thing. But um, in, as far as our funding, the, the main thing we're retaining with our funding is the outreach work, which we all thought was really the key piece of this uh, and um, part of the funding is, you know, involved the sort of extension of the shelter at Bethany, which, you know, the congregate shelters like that aren't going to happen, at least in the near future. Um, so I, I do believe that the state and local providers are working on trying to be innovative in the alternatives, but uh, someone, state and or feds are going to have to come up, you know, this is, we're talking about acquiring places and that, you know. Yeah. Thing. I don't think our 12,000 or whatever is going to make a big difference in terms of that, but we, we obviously remain committed to providing extra attention to the homeless community, and particularly to the out, outreach worker. Thanks. Oh, oh Connor, yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, I think, Bill, you probably explained this last time, but uh, just looking at that, like the COLA, I know fire is excluded because of the collective bargaining agreement. Did we not have a COLA built into the other two bargaining units, sir? So we did. Um, I mean, we in, for the budget, we estimated COLA for everybody. Um, what we've 
Uh, so what we have done, we've agreed with the, the public works department has agreed to go basically just extend their one, their contract for one year with no change uh, other than, you know, the steps and things, but um, with the proviso that if someone else gets it, gets a COLA, then they would get it too. With the police department, we've agreed to hold off on any negotiations until later in the year when we have a clearer picture. So, um, you know, it may be that if, if revenues change and we get to the middle of the year, um, we would be able to do something like, you know, make a change and, and do that, in which case we would then have to, to do something with public works. And same thing with the non-union people, obviously we've, we've planned it. So that savings is in this projected savings, but it's also something we can do. You know, I mean, obviously nobody likes to do these things, but we've been fortunate that we haven't had to lay anybody off and many people are out of work. And as we've heard from a lot of people, there are a lot of, of, of community needs. So um, that seemed like a sacrifice our, our folks could make. Um, that That's right. Okay. Thanks, Bill. It's, uh, I think it's uh, just worth noting. Uh, we appreciate the employees stepping up here to an agree into that. It's uh uh, and it, I think it's a compassionate budget with no layoffs. Yeah, agreed. Dan. Yeah, it, it, just as a sort of further clarification, I mean, looking at some of the numbers of what's being cut, it looks like this is a lot of deferred maintenance and vehicle purchases and equipment that it's, um, but could you or Kelly explain just, I'm um, either not remembering or understanding when we talk about this, the, the, 366,000 uh, cut in DPW, what exactly that breaks out to? Kelly, do you want to take that one? Yes, I'm happy to. Um, let me just pull up my sheet here. Um, and Donna's also on the call. So Donna, feel free to jump in at any time. Um, so, oh, and actually I've got the wrong sheet up here. Um, Bear with me. Um, do you mind if I just pull up my notes? Take your time. It's okay. Thank you. But and while she's doing that, um, I'll filibuster for a minute. Uh, we did, you know, I think I said this last time that if if this were we're looking at this as a you know a crisis budget as a you know we've got these this big revenue hit that hopefully right. will be you know one time. And so addressing it was really to see, you know, we did look for large projects and large purchases that could be deferred with the idea that even if revenues came back, normal, some of them could be done in the spring. Remember this fiscal year, it goes from July all the way to next June, right? To this time next year. So if funding came back, maybe some of these projects could be done still in this fiscal year or some of these purchases could be done. You know, if this were going to be, and, you know, we may learn, more over the course of the year. If this were going to be the new standard, um, then we probably would have to look more systemically at all of our programs and staffing and what we're offering and those kinds of things. I think our, our goal here was to keep the city services as people expect them and to meet the needs of people and to slowly plan for our programs coming back uh, and and um, just hold off on big big dollar purchases. So this this is definitely not a sustainable strategy for the long run. This is definitely a, this is what we're doing, COVID emergency FY21. Um, we'll have to, you know, and, and that's why we want to evaluate it month, quarter by quarter. And we'll have probably a different conversation based on what we know come November, December when we're talking about FY22 budget. Sure, sure. I just wanted to make sure that I underst understood. And, I, you know, I think that goes to Connor's point, which is that it is a humane budget um, because it does keep the staff, you know, as, at the levels currently. Um, it doesn't force, you know, a family to take this hit in loss of employment. Um, and, you know, it really focuses, I understand it's it's not a long-term sustainable budgeting model, but it's certainly one that we could take for this year or for, you know, for the short term and allows us to, to build back in um, some of these. So I, that I, that I fully get. And so. And I, I want to, 
Go ahead. I'll weigh in on that though a little bit. So yes, of course we care about our employees very much so, and we have, have great employees and we certainly don't want to disrupt their lives. But every one of those employees represents services that we provide to the residents they pay for through their taxes and that they're having trouble paying for. And so, um, you know, we want to make sure we have adequate people to plow the roads come winter and that we to respond to emergency calls and to provide services at the senior center if the revenues come in and the rec, you know, so it, to manage our finances properly uh, and not, not lose track of the city's money. So I, I Yes, we want to be humane as far as employees go, but we also, you know, we have significantly cut back on our services in, over the last three months to try to balance this budget. And we need, you, you know, it's getting to the point where it's not necessarily humane to the folks that are still working in some of these departments because they're, they're overworked. So we need to bring folks back to deliver the goods. So yes, it's great. I mean, but I, I don't want tax no that might be listening to this saying, you know, they didn't cut this because they were being humane. Yes, we're trying to be humane to our employees, but we're also trying to make sure that we can deliver the promises that people voted for uh, as, as best that we can. No, that's a, that's a good point, Bill, and I, I appreciate that. So I've got the detail that you were looking for, and I can get into the specifics of the um, dollars associated, um, but you know, in whole and in summary, you know, the, the things that are happening, so I'll just start there, um, but then the things that, you know, this is comprised of, I'll go to there after that, but um, based on the priority listing that we got from Public Works, the following projects are proposed to move forward. Um, they are Clarendon Avenue, Taylor Street, Westwood Drive, Chestnut Hill Culvert, and Crack Ceiling. And then the projects that will be delayed and are included in this um, $366,000 figure um, our Cumming Street, Hubbard Street, retain, Retaining Wall, uh, Barry, and Loomis Spa Repair. So it was those big ticket items. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. But as you were saying before, these are items, if the budget projections become rosier, can be uh, worked back into the budget. Correct. Yes. Okay. But we should also remind ourselves, no one likes to, but... Um, there's also a different scenario that we could be looking at at the end of the first quarter where additional sure. need to be taken from the budget. So it's going to, you know, we just need to see how this rolls out. Well, and, and, and along those lines, and not to play sort of, um, you know, a, the doom scenario, but, you know, would there be a point at which you would start to look to cut back some of those services? Um, you know, uh, yes. I mean, it, it obviously would be in conjunction with you all making priorities. Um, but, you know, if, if we had another, you know, just, just as we did this spring, uh, we have, you know, we don't have, and I, nor would I even suggest, you know, we seek any additional tax authority. I don't think raising taxes more than what we already passed is, is a viable solution. For, for people, so our, our budget's set. Um, we don't have any more money coming in, and, and, and if we have less, so now we're looking at the revenue side, and so we would have to, yes, I mean, we would have to make adjustments, and I, I don't know, again, it depends on the gravity of the situation, you know, what where we might look first, um, but there's no question that our, our programs and services would have to be on, on the table because there's no money to pay for them. Right. I think um, we, um, the other part of what's um, occurring in the coming fiscal year is we're not bringing back our staff um, as early as we would have liked to. We're also um, handicapped um, in terms of the amount of everyday um, work that our team can do. Um, we're not filling positions that are vacant in public works. And so that will reduce not just the projects that we can handle, but these everyday um, situations. And, you know, that may include um, situations in which our, um, the, the members of our general public are um, 
typically looking at street sweeping happening at a certain time and that may be delayed. And we're going through that right now in that education experience with our citizens. Um, and um, so I think that the expectation for the amount of work that will be able to be accomplished that's um, typically done regular, putting up signs, taking things down, um, aside from responding to emergencies, it will be slower in the coming year. And that's not to say that we won't um, have a healthy environment for our residents to live and work in, but it will be different. And um, I just want to make that point so that we're not expecting the same level of service, even though we're not doing um, the um, projects that were planned. Um, and I think it will also impact the following year because um, we have a plan for the following year for the number of projects. So we're missing projects this year. We're working with reduced efforts um, because of the lack of staffing. Um, so we'll need to talk about that as we go forward, even if everything recovers, because um, we just can't possibly make up the time. Um, Yeah, everything's going to get pushed back into next year. So, right, there's going right. to be no effect. You know, it makes me think about, um, you know, that plan that we had to uh, just keep up with with maintenance. Um, and it, I'm, I'm sort of assuming that that's what you're referring to. But really, like, it, it sets us back a year almost. It, well, and, and that, again, it's with the time, right? Like, it just puts everything... Right. A little bit further out. Um, so, thanks for thanks for bringing that up too, because I think that that's important. Um, a good, I'll, I'll give you a good all a good example. We have um, some um, problems on Nelson and Ridge Street, um, resulting from last year's um, situation in which we had to repair the street. So, um, we typically would have taken care of um, the um, issues with the pavement there um, within 24 hours. The cones are still up. It's been almost a week. Um, and we will be getting to them within the next few days or early next week. Um, but repairing five, um, you know, culverts along that street has taken us far longer to get to because of all the other emergencies and issues and regular work that was in the queue. Um, so that's, that's a really different level of service for the community. And, um, and part of the reason I'm mentioning it is because as we move forward, um, you all may um, be getting some calls or concerns registered with you from your constituents because it's one thing to have that go on for a month or two months, but to go on for six months um, may be a different story. So, um, and we're every day we're trying to adapt and decide how to be more proactive. Um, so, um, we are working on it, but that's the reality we're facing with the cuts and the, um, and the budget that we have. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Connor, did you have something you wanted to ask? No. Oh, okay. I thought I saw it. I can, but I'm, I was wrong. Um, anyone else have a council have a clarifying question at this point? Okay, um, so um, if there are folks that want to um, weigh in from the public, um, now is it okay time to do that? Feel free to either raise your hand by clicking on the participant button at the bottom of your screen or um, just unmute yourself. Mayor, I'm not seeing anyone. Okay. Um, all right, well, um, there is otherwise no um, action to be taken on this item as we approved it last time. Um, so um, 
thank you again. Thanks for um, letting us have this, this conversation again. And I'm glad we were able to give um, some other folks a, a chance to weigh in on it. Um, so um, and thank you again for your good work on this. And, you know, we're going to hope for the best and um, see what happens. Okay. Um, all right. So moving on then. Um, so we're on to discussion about Langdon Street. Um, so we have a recommendation from staff here. And I, I know, uh, Connor, you were a, a big part of that as well. Um, so thanks for, for your time and thanks for staff's time figuring this out. Um, e either Bill or Connor, would you like to? I'll to start and then turn it over to uh, Donna and Connor. Um, oh, Donna, okay, yes, right. right. Uh, so at the last meeting, the council directed staff to look at an option which closed off completely the back section of Langdon Street. And we did do that and we did draft up a plan for it and discovered a fair amount of uh, concerns with it, including uh, the, the need to turn onto private property to make turns that, you know, sort of creating a dead end. And, and so, um, but we were in looking at that, uh, Donna and Connor and, and some folks from our DBW met with folks on Langdon Street about what, you know, to try to understand what they really needed and, and what worked with them. And, understanding that this doesn't necessarily get us to the point of, uh, you know, this vision of wanting to close the street. And I, we continue to have the same problems, um, you know, the access to, that, that can't be solved in the short term, I think. So I'm going to turn it over to Donna and Connor. Donna and Connor. They, they spoke with folks. And so this proposal basically reflects that conversation, which hopefully will allow particularly the restaurants to expand out um, and still allow full access to the street for the people that need it. So um, there you go. Connor, do you want to go first? No, I think like, you know, sort of the genesis of this is to help the businesses on Langdon Street, get things up and running, get employees back to work, make sure we don't have more empty storefronts there. And, uh, you know, I, I think I come in at, at it with the, with the direction, let's just get it done soon. Let's get these tables out there so they can get back to work. Um, I, I think there's a lot of logistics to be worked out. There's way more when Don and I went down the street with Chief Gallons and uh, you know, we were talking to folks and it's like, can we just simplify this as much as possible? And the simplest answer is just close that one, one lane there, let them expand out. We spoke to other business owners uh, like Juliana at Jay Langdon. And she was like, let's just, you know, it's a team effort on Langdon Street. Let's just get it done. I, I have, uh, I'm not going to lie to you, I have fantasies of Langdon Street someday becoming like a mini church street. I would love if we had cobblestones on there, festivals going every weekend. It could be a beautiful thing. Um, but that, that's not the purpose of this. This is, this is an ec economic development issue. So I think uh, as it was written up, I, I think it gives us the ability to get done as quick as possible. And as the summer goes on, you know, we could always tweak it or something, but let, like, let's not lose focus of where we're actually at. Let's keep businesses open. Um, you know, Corey chimed in from BBW. Uh, other restaurants might want a similar accommodation, but if you look at it, it's, it's not too many and we can take it as it comes. Um, so I, I think this is a very reasonable plan to just get up and running as quick as possible. I think, um, so, I think the benefits of this plan are that um, it addresses um, traffic and creates a safe environment for delivery trucks, um, the maintenance of um, the separation between a public way and private property. Um, it allows um, significant room for the restaurants to utilize to their maximum benefit. It keeps the people who would be using those restaurants in a safe situation. Um, and as Connor represented, it can be um, put together in a relatively short amount of time. Um, it still allows some parking on the streets, um, which was also a situation situation that was becoming bothersome. Um, it doesn't require any of the off-street parking that where um, private um, citizens and some of the uh, store owners currently park. 
Um, so we resolved all those um, issues by coming up with this solution. It, it, and it, I think it's an interesting opportunity to begin to jump into this, um, test the waters, um, create an opportunity to see what else can happen. And I think because the conversation we've already had um, was very much a team effort by everybody participating in the conversation that we can overcome whatever small hurdles we need to um, in quick time in order to keep this going as successfully as possible. If the worst case occurs, people don't come, the restaurants aren't um, satisfied financially or otherwise with the program that we're, we've laid out, it can also be taken apart very quickly without a lot of infrastructure um, change or damage to anything surrounding it. And we can move on to another potential solution um, or they, something else will happen that allows them to open up um, and have more indoor seating. Um, so I think that is the best option we have right now to satisfy um, all of the different perspectives that we were trying to deal with. And I, I see that Bob Gowans is um, on this uh, Zoom meeting. And so Bob, if you wanna share any information, um, I'd invite you to do that because you were an integral part of those conversations as well. No, the only thing I would add is that um, this plan allows for a consistent emergency vehicle access. It right. doesn't completely shut the street down. So it's a good plan. It allows the restaurants to get open and um, accommodates emergency vehicle access. So I think it's, it's probably the best solution we have right now. Okay, well, it seems like this would work and meet the needs of some businesses on the street. Um, uh, you know, I remember early on, we, we said we uh, were interested in entertaining some alternative ideas and if businesses had um, uh, ideas for something out of the box that so we would certainly be interested in entertaining those ideas and, you know, wor working with folks as much as we could. Um, so I, it seems like this is um, gonna, gonna work particularly for a couple of restaurants on Langdon Street, which is excellent. Um, at least that's, that's my opinion anyway. Um, I, I'm gonna just check in with councils first and then I see Elizabeth, you've got a, a comment, but anything from council here? Yes, go ahead, uh, Donna. I just would like to thank um, Donna Casey and Bob and Connor uh, for the time. And it looks like a, a creative way to do something small enough, we can do it soon and not disturb too much of what's going on there, but add something to enhance for the businesses. So I think it's it's good. I support it. Uh, Jack. I agree with Donna. I think what we're trying to do here, and I spent time like all the rest of the, the council out on the street, trying to figure out walking back and forth, up and down Langdon Street and with the tape measure and everything, trying to figure out exactly what we could make work. and as much as some people, probably myself included, like the idea of having Langdon Street be a pedestrian mall or something, the practicality of doing it raises some challenges that I don't know if we'll ever be able to resolve. And certainly we were not able to resolve in the time frames we're talking about here. So I think that being able to do something that works quickly is, uh, is of great value, so I su support this also. Any, um, anyone else? Um, one question I have, just to just clarify, sort of like talking about the flags and how long the flags stay up for. Um, with this uh, change, as it's a temporary change, I assume if we, uh, that this would be for the duration of as long as parking is, um, free basically uh, downtown and that if we wanted to extend it beyond that, I assume we'd have to revisit it at that point. Is that a fair statement? I wouldn't necessarily link it to the parking because okay. we know what could be, you know, we may want to bring that back e even without changing this. Uh, we're not sure about that. We're still trying to figure that out. I, I, I think our assumption it was it would be through 
the same period of time that we authorized the parklets, the temporary parklets. So that was like October. Whatever. Oh, okay. Got you. Yep. Um, and then, you know, by then, you know, the practicality is that the, the, the demand for the outside seating will resolve itself as it gets later into October because people won't want to sit out as much. Um, so, you know, right. just be too cold. So okay. um, I would think we would do it into October. And if the restaurants say, hey, nobody's sitting there, we can, we can end it earlier. But in the meantime, no later than whatever the parklet date is. Incidentally, we've had two ap applications for parklets already come in. Great. Okay, that's encouraging. Um, Dan, did you have something? And then let's go to Elizabeth. Yeah, no, no, I was just going to echo what, what Bill said, is that I, I envision this as tied to the parklets. Great. Uh, Elizabeth. I just wanted to say that um, I know that Bill and, and Dan Groberg were on the um, BCRD Streets uh, for Success uh, call a um, number of weeks ago. And, uh, you know, this is, um, uh, I just wanted the Greater Montpelier community to realize that this is an initiative um, that's being encouraged through the state. And I'm so happy that Montpelier is jumping in and supporting business. Uh, by looking at uh, different possibilities of what can be done with Langdon Street. And it is such a complex issue. And uh, one of the things that um, was discussed uh, in Streets for Success is that trying these uh, very low impact pilot projects uh, give us a sense of how things can work and uh, you know, allow us the mobility to, you know, to try something and potentially try something like it somewhere else. So bravo to all of you who've put in such so much time. I really uh, applaud your efforts. Thank you. I just want to add in here, I mean, so well, actually you guys should vote on whether you want to do this temporary thing. I was had a more of a long-term comment. Uh, Connor, go ahead. Uh, if it's appropriate, I know we just had discussion, but if it's appropriate to make a motion, I would move to uh, approve the plan outlined in Donna Barlow Casey's memo. Second. Oh, second. Um, further discussion. Um, um, so my only uh, the only thing that I want to um, raise there is uh, so the the barrier between that we're we're picturing was the snow fencing. Um, uh, yes. Uh, do we are are how are you feeling about having traffic? right there with um i know this, this is like i'm in favor of it i'm gonna vote for it but if i if i needed to probably i wouldn't need to but um but uh i i'm curious for your thoughts on the safety of having the because i mean for parklets we're like oh you know it has to be something you know substantial uh and re reflective etc um what are your thoughts on having traffic right right there next to folks so there's actually enough room. Um, we measured it out. We could go as far as the direct center of the street and set the tables slightly back from the edge of the snow fencing that's held up by orange cones. Um, the approaching um, traffic would have sufficient time to identify that and see that in advance. We'd bring the... Um, we're bringing the fencing down and then to the right um, before um, before you get to the restaurant. So I think that um, that works out really nicely for us um, because we're taking the other half of the street and then the parking area. So even trucks would have the ability. Um, we measured it off and looked at it. Um, so I think that it will work and it will be safe. And the people who are sitting in the restaurant at the restaurant tables will also feel safe. But if not, we can easily modify that. Um, and, and we would respond to that pretty quickly, so. Okay, great, thank you. I just wanted to make sure I um, just raise that issue. Um, okay, so any further conversation on this? And uh, Cameron, anyone that you're seeing has got a hand? Okay. Um, all right, so any further discussion? Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay. Um, great. Well, so um, 
when do you suppose this will be able to to go up? Um, we'll have that converse, I'll have that conversation with my team tomorrow and we'll see as soon as possible. That will be our goal. Well, so. And fully understanding that you all are quite stretched. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, for this, we'll make, um, we'll make a great effort to act quickly, um, and get it pulled together. So great. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, thanks everyone for, for your work to figure this out. Um, all right, so the next uh, thing up was uh, the uh, coronavirus COVID-19 response update. Uh, so uh, I'm guessing I should be turning it over to Cameron um, on this. Go for it. There's a theme. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I sent the memo out earlier and for members of the public, the memo will be um, on the agenda packet for tonight, um, first thing in the morning. Um, so. I'm gonna go through this real quick. Um, the state update since last time we met, um, the governor has put forward another economic recovery and relief package. I'm asking for $90 uh, million dollars for phase two. Um, this plan has gone to the legislature for consideration and um, action. On June 15th, uh, the governor updated and extended the state of emergency in Vermont through July 15th. So for us, that sort of impacts um, the fact that we can continue to do Zoom meetings um, and not have a staff member or a council person um, in the room that the public needs to be able to access through July 15th. Um, that goes for our committee meetings as well. Um, he also, also ties in to our mask regulations, right? Yes, it does. Thank you. All right, can I just clarify that for one second? So do... So our committee is able to meet after, I know we'd had sort of a moratorium on committees, uh, but after July 1st, it's okay for them to meet, but they have to meet remotely. Yes, we're encouraging everyone to continue to meet remotely. Um, okay. Staff is slowly returning. And so committees were asking them to work with their staff representative to get their schedules back up and running. Perfect, okay, thank you. Um, he also put out additional guidance providing that campgrounds and marinas can operate at uh, almost at a thousand, a hundred percent capacity. On June 17th, they have eased restrictions on Vermonters in long-term care facilities, hospitals, and for those over the age of 65. Beginning June 19th, outdoor visitation has resumed at long-term care facilities. Long-term care facilities can allow for up to two visitors per day per residence, and those meetings have to be outside only. Um, Vermonters over the age of 65 are no longer required to stay at home, but they have asked them to um, take special precautions when they are going out. They also issued guidance restarting senior centers, but I'll touch a little bit on that further down this line. June 19th, um, they did uh, have some more, as they call it, the turn of the spigot. Uh, effective this Friday, June 26th, restaurants, arts, culture, and entertainment venues can go from 25% to 50% capacity. The cap for indoor establishments is at 75 people, and outdoor operations are capped at 150 people, or 50% of their total capacity, whichever is less. And then today, the governor held a press conference where he discussed the following. He did remind everyone that the census is very important, so I do kind of want to take a moment to remind folks to take the census. Um, Vermont is currently ranking 47th out of all 50 states, and those who have done the census, it's very easy. It takes a couple minutes. As you can get to it at 2020census.gov or calling 844-330. 2020. This week, Vermont State Parks are all opening with day use activities, tents, RV sites, and lean to camping allowed. They did also have an online reservation system put up. Um, you can find that at the Vermont State Parks website. There is also a new outbreak that they announced in the Fairhaven region with about 12 cases connected to a single employer. They are still testing employees and the state is offering more testing opportunities in the Rutland area for residents. So that's the state updates. For our updates, we do wanna let folks know that we are opening um, our pool pavilion 
now for renters with a pack it in, pack it out policy regarding trash and with understanding there's reduced recreation staff able to maintain it to its full extent. Um, the city phase one reopening plan was approved and we are starting to reopen this city hall facility on Tuesdays and Thursdays for appointments starting July 2nd. The Porta Johns behind City Hall and the Senior Center will remain until we're able to open City Hall full time for bathroom access. I'll remind the public that if you are coming to use our restrooms or the facilities, we are opening the downstairs bathrooms for the public um, and ask you to come through the back door of the building um, because it's easier to access the bathrooms that way. Um, regarding the Senior Center, uh, the governor did announce that senior centers could begin the process of reopening. We are still without a lot of our um, staff that supports that uh, department right now. So as they start onboarding, we will be creating plans to open. We want to make sure that we are compliant with the state guidelines and are as safe as possible. So at this time, the earliest date we can expect the senior center to reopen under limited circumstances is August 10th. But that is only an estimate at this time, and we will keep you updated um, every step we take to open that center. Um, you know, the folks that go to that center are at our highest risk and we do wanna make sure that their safety is our highest concern. Um, I did want to uh, reiterate that the city council's mask ordinance is now extended to July 15th, like Bill mentioned, because of the state of emergency has been extended. Also to make note that um, council member Erickson in partnership with the city manager's office and the Hunger Mountain Co-op will be purchasing masks. I didn't have an update on that timeline. I didn't know if you wanted to give an update, um, council member, but I, I just put that in there because I know that that's something that we are working on. I just I just heard from the co-op yesterday and they're still waiting on delivery without okay. a, you know, they were hoping it would have been last week, but um, as soon as I get an update, I'll let you know. Um, as I've been updating you on our city communications, um, we had a little bit of a turn. We have been trying to um, post more about social issues and communicating your information regarding those issues. So our um, COVID-19 related posts have gone down a little bit and now we're averaging this month or since last update over 600 interactions each. So we're still doing really well um, and we're still reaching quite a few people. Um, I just want to let you know I give you these updates because I just want to let you know um, how our reach is going. Uh, we are communicating in multiple different ways, but that's the easiest one for us to track the metrics for. So that's my update for this week, if anyone has any questions. Not seeing any questions necessarily, anybody? Okay. Um, actually, I do I do have a question, actually. Um, uh, this is something that's come up sort of periodically uh, over time um, with either the COVID updates or actually th this is a little bit not related, but just thinking about um, the, our weekly reports. Uh, do we have a listserv that um, the general public could be on that would potentially receive uh, either the council reports or these kinds of updates? I'm, I'm assuming we don't, but... Uh, yeah, I'm looking at Bill. I don't believe we no. do. <laughs> no, we don't have a listserv. I mean, we obviously we are on the social media. We're on our website and those kinds of things. And um, But no, we don't have a specific local... Yeah. I don't know if... I, I, I do kind of wonder if um, that would be of interest. Has anybody else heard anything that that, that would be useful? Um, if not, that's fine. But uh, you know, just always trying to think of like what are ways that we can get the word out to to folks. And I'm, you know. we can anyway. certainly um, look into that. Miss, but also, oops, sorry, I just say it feels a little to me at least like front porch firm is the community listserv. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's. There's fair. also you know we could be more proactive about putting the weekly report um, in full. Uh, either linked or um, in full on Front Porch Forum and other means. So, yeah, just to help keep people yeah. informed. I think I think that would be useful. I think a lot of folks don't know the the good work that we're doing, and um, that would be one uh, just an additional way to help highlight um, 
maybe just either what's going on or um, just help keep people informed. Um, Jack. Now, I'm, I think I'm confused. Uh, I, I, I heard Bill and Cameron say uh, we don't have a list, sir, but is it possible for anyone to subscribe to the get on the mailing list for the weekly uh, manager's report? Probably. I, mean, I think so. I'd, I'd want to check, double check that with Jasmine. I mean, I do think we have a list of people that have requested and they do, they're on the automatic mailing list. Yes. So but, maybe those COVID things should go to that list too. Right. Uh, well, of course, the COVID updates are in the weekly report each week. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah the one I, the memo I create for y'all on these nights is sort of a, uh, combination of my weekly reports um plus things that i thought you may be interested in knowing so yeah okay but, so 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 people can get that mm -hmm. okay good thanks yeah. that's what i thought okay all right great thanks for that sort of a brief aside there um any other questions or comments about this okay all right well thank you again um thanks Cameron for keeping us all up to date on all this. Um, it's helpful, especially as things continue to evolve. Um, all right, and so we have uh, the last item on our agenda and it is not 10 o'clock, that's fabulous. Um, so uh, five home farm way. Uh, so Bill. Sure. Um, I'll start with a little bit of background just uh, for all that are watching and also to help frame everything. Uh, Five Home Farm Ways, you know, property out near Agway. Uh, it, and a year ago, the city declared it a public nuisance due to its condition. It was considered to be a dangerous building. And the city actually uh, fenced it and boarded it up uh, and then requested a mitigation plan as per our public nuisance ordinance from the owner. And while this wasn't news to us at that time, it certainly brought a long-standing um, issue to its head, which is that the owner of the property is Foodworks, which is a dissolved nonprofit. So the, the owner doesn't exist. Uh, there's a mortgage held on it by the Vermont uh, Community Loan Fund uh, for approximately $100,000. There is a uh, preservation easement on it held on by the Preservation Trust of Vermont. Uh, particularly pertaining to the house and the front two acres of the property that they will be used. Technically, the house is supposed to be restored to sort of its period uh, glory. And then, the, uh, and then the grounds are supposed to be used in a historically significant way. There's a conservation easement on the back, 12 to 15 acres, which is in the floodway anyway, not really particularly developable. And it's just supposed to be held in public conservation. Um, and that's held by the Vermont Conservation Board, Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, excuse me. Um, adding to the complexity is the neighboring property, Connor Brothers LLC, has a right of first refusal to purchase the property um, that had been granted to them by Foodworks. Uh, and that, um, and again, the Foodworks doesn't exist. The easement holders dispute the authority of Food Works to have granted that right of first refusal. So, uh, at the time of the public nuisance ordinance, uh, our action declaring it a nuisance, uh, a, a consortium of people headed by a gentleman named Jamie Duggan came forth and said, We'd like to try to save this building. We'd like to see if we can put together a fundraising campaign and, and bring you a plan and including, uh, and so the council said yes, uh, with the proviso that you give us a, an update every three months. And they have been doing so. Uh, the last couple of updates had said, we're engaging an attorney, we're trying to sort through these ownership and easement issues. Uh, and, uh, and the most recent one was due a couple months ago, and, because of tabling, we're just getting to it now. Uh, but the report, which is in, in the packet, came from Mr. Duggan basically said, we think the legal issues are insurmountable and we don't have the wherewithal to move forward with this. So at its simplest, the question back before the council is, 
we have an enforcement out, order out there. We asked for a mitigation plan. The, the party that we authorized or granted permission to develop one has said that they're not going to do it. So, you know, our options are to move forward and uh, schedule it for demolition, set a date, do nothing. Uh, we have, so having said that, we've been in conversations with these groups. I think there's a little bit of a uh, waiting to see who goes first. I think some of the groups want to see what the city chooses to do. And I think those of us from the city would just as soon see them resolve their differences and, and come up with a plan. Um, and I certainly don't want to speak for any of those groups, but that's been what I've heard. We have engaged an attorney. The uh, attorney general's office has been engaged. Uh, two things I can tell you since the last meeting that have changed that are of some substance. One is that our the, the attorney general uh, uh, asked the city to look into the issue of, of declaring it abandoned and what that might mean for the various easements. Uh, he wasn't sure what that would mean. So he said, you need to look at that uh, and see if that's a way to go. The second thing is our attorney uh, asked me why, he was new to this case, asked me why we hadn't sort of put it up for tax sale or taken it for taxes. And my response was, well, it's a, it's been, it's a, non, it's a nonprofit. It's owned by FoodWorks, so it has been tax exempt. And his response, which was good advice, says, well, the statute doesn't say who owns it. It says, is it being used for those public uh, purposes for, you know, for which are tax exempt? And the answer right now is no. So um, we've recently listed it as a taxable property uh, in hopes that that might also prod some people to taking extent. I don't know that I mean, it's still, there's a period of time when it's not like we'll be taking it for tax sale tomorrow. And we've got to go through a tax cycles and people, them not paying. And, and who knows, perhaps the, uh, the mortgage holder will pay the taxes so as not to lose their interest. Uh, but that is a change um, so that's happened. Um, so I think the purpose of this conversation really is to ascertain what role the city wants to play in this. Um, we've been trying to be a broker. I think the attorney general is probably a better honest, not honest, but a better neutral broker than we are since we do stand to, uh, to have, uh, under, under almost any scenario, the back 12 to 15 acres would be coming to the city for public use, some sport, whether it's recreation park, community garden, dog park, any number of public areas public things that could could benefit the community. Um, I think the Preservation Trust might want to see the city take the front two acres and understanding that the building might need to come down uh, as long as the rest of the property was uh, sort of signed and used for public use and made clear that it had had some historic significance and that it would be a fully open park. And I think, you know, I don't, I don't know if we have interest in that. I, I think that um, certainly the, the community loan fund would like to see themselves get paid off under those circumstances. And again, I think we might have a challenge um, from Connors that they have a right to first refusal. I think for, from the city's perspective, I, absent a clear directive from the council, and that just because we haven't talked about it, I have told, I have stated regularly that the city is neutral on the house, that we, we um, would be happy to see some sort of public use, but we'd be equally happy to see additional taxable property, additional jobs, uh, that both, that we see a public benefit to either outcome. Uh, and so we're not here to push for one or the other. Uh, and we would support a solution uh, that, that that resulted in those. And actually our parks director weighed in in favor of that as well. So that's the, the nature of the, the conversations. I think the, the key questions is, do we have strong feelings about the house property? Um, are we wanting to move forward to address the, the nuisance or are we wanting to sit tight and push the negotiations a little bit? I do, I, I do think some of the city's actions have prompted conversations that had not happened for four or five years. This isn't a new scenario. Um, 
So we, I think we've simulated some discussion. I don't know, you know, what each each group has to do. In some regards, I, you know, I can't overstate this. The the real controlling factor here on the house portion is the easement, the preservation trust easement, because as it stands now, a person acquire a, a, an entity can acquiring that property is required to bring the property back to its its full you know former uh, condition historically accurate condition and i think that has is what has prevented the um the bank the the community loan fund from foreclosing and i think it's certainly prevented others from wanting to just buy it uh, from the community you know loan fund or you know, and who can even sell it, right? Uh, because whoever, at this point, you're assuming that liability. Um, and I know that uh, the Preservation Trust has been asked to remove that easement, even asked, has been offered to, to have it, the you know, amount of the investment paid back to them um, in exchange for removing it. And Thus far, they have not done so. Um, the staff simply says, it's up to our board, we can't make that commitment. They don't usually do that. I don't know if it's ever been brought to their board. Um, so those are, those are the scenarios. I, whereas I think the back portion, the BHCB portion, there's not much debate that that should ultimately come to the city and use for public use. So we're really talking about the front portion and what our role is and how aggressive we want to be um, with regard to the house and the, the condition of the house. And mindful of the fact that we, the city has declared it a public nuisance. Um, just as a clarifying question, Bill, could you describe um, a little bit about, I mean, I don't know that this is the direction we should go, but if we were going to, um, be collecting or basically billing for back taxes uh, uh, with a, as a, you know, and basically come to the point where it was a, a tax sale. Um, could you just describe that process? Like what, how long would that take? I mean, is, do we just say, here's a bill for all the, you know, the yeah, back so, taxes? So or? first of all, we can't bill for back taxes because we okay. didn't list it as a taxable property. Um, we had listed it as a, so it starts now. Um, I am not 100% conversant. There may be actually a couple of attorneys that know more about uh, tax, uh, tax sales than I do on, on our board, uh, but there's a period of time that has to go by with, with back taxes. And after, after that goes, I wanna say it's a year or two at least, uh, then the city can say, we wanna redeem our taxes. So someone can pay the, off the taxes, then they, and there's a certain period of time where the owner has the right to redeem, to pay them back. And, and, and a lot of people do that for interest because the pay, then they collect interest on that, that payment. If, if then the owner never redeem, pays off the original tax sale, then that person becomes the new owner of the property. So sometimes, and city has said that many cities will themselves buy the properties at tax sale as their own investment and they can either get paid back in the future by the owner or then, then own the property. Um, I have no reason to believe that if we put this up for a tax sale, you know, it's entirely possible Connors would, would pay the taxes on it, or the, as I said, or the, the um, bank, because they want to protect their investments. Sure, so having it go to a tax sale, it doesn't necessarily mean that it would come to the city, it just, it could, but someone else could also it would open the door for someone else to to claim ownership and actually be a real owner. And I guess one of the, you know, the outstanding question that we're looking at is, is under those conditions, do those easements and restrictions carry forward? Or are they extinguished when the property, you know, I don't know. So it, it's still, I mean, the, the number one reason no one, no one wants to buy the property as is, is because you, you can't do anything with it without a, giant investment of, of money. And I think if someone were to go the route of, if, if there was gonna be a, a fair and equitable solution where, so everyone was made whole, it would seem that, you know, from a financial perspective, I don't know if these groups agree with this, but I would think that the bank would need to get paid off, that's a hundred and some odd thousand. 
the easement would need to be paid off, which is 57,000. And then someone's got to pay for demolishing the building, which is going to be at least 50,000. So you're talking 200 plus thousand just to get to a parcel that, you know, may or may not, you know, who knows how developable it is. We don't know what other issues there are. With that. Okay. Thank you. Um, Dan. Oh, sorry. I was just going to add, um, you know, I, I, my general understanding, at least in tax sales, is that easements usually do go with the property. Liens, mortgages, they get they get discharged. Um, but something that's an easement that runs with the land goes with the land, even in a tax sale. And, you know, the basic rule in a tax sale is you, you have this accumulated back taxes that almost never amount to as much as the mortgage uh investment so it's you know it's going to be several hundred it's not going to be several hundred thousand it's going to be ten thousand um by the time it ever gets to a tax sale and it's an auction and then it's a year of redemption and you know it's it's not the fastest process um either um and a lot of stuff can happen within that so i just wanted to offer that yeah, yeah it's definitely not a golden solution but it is at least a minor change in status that's occurred since we last talked about this. So I thought you all should know about that. Um, um, I'm, I still feel like I have some questions. Like, for example, Dan, I'm not necessarily familiar with this process of redemption. Um, can you just, what is ah, what does that mean? Ah, Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. No, it's a wonderful process. So what happens is um, when you have back taxes and there's, there's no real fine line uh, to when you have to, other than I think eight years is the limit. You can't collect more than eight years back in back taxes. So usually when properties accumulate a certain amount, um, Bev Hill for the city of Montpelier does it. Um, she'll list it for tax sale, which means it goes to a public auction. Um, and a lot of people do bid on it and they can bid in excess of what's owed on the taxes. Um, and that money is then held by the city and they take the first amount of that money and they pay off the back taxes and the rest is held in sort of an escrow fund and uh, it sits there and the owner has one year in which they still own the property, they still control the property, it's still theirs in which they can redeem the property by coming up with everything that's owed. And that means the taxes that have been paid on their behalf, um, the interest on those amounts, um, usually any type of fees that the city has um, accumulated to a certain amount uh, in doing the tax sale, but that has a limit, it's about 15% of the taxes owed. Um, and then usually you have to come up with actually the other amount of money that the person is holding just because you, you make the bidder whole to redeem the property. So for example, if it's 10,000 owed and the person bids 40,000, you're gonna to have to come up with that 40,000 and how that gets allocated is a little bit complicated, but you gotta come up with that whole chunk of money and then you get the property back and you basically buy it back and you have a year. And at the end of that year, um, that's when your right as the owner disappears and it's gone, no longer yours. It's now owned by whoever put in the winning bid. As you can imagine, there's all kinds of issues with that. And every title insurance company in the state of Vermont despises tax sales because they can complicate title uh, in, a, in unexpected ways. And so um, it's not a good way to go about transferring property. I mean, it may be a solution here because it it, it removes uh, some of the loggerhead, but um, it is a complicated process and it has a number of pitfalls and you have due process. And it's especially difficult here because the entity doesn't exist. So who, you know, you could always have somebody come out of the woods at the last minute and go, I'm the, I'm the owner. I've declared myself by, you know, filing something that I'm the new food works um, better than the old. And here's my money and give me my property back. And it, it, there are stories like that. Um, I, I actually just represented somebody who helped someone who was in a tax sale buy the property out from underneath the person who had won a tax sale. So it was, um, <laughs> it, 
these are, you know, you, you think tax sale, you think plain vanilla ice cream, but it's, it's, it's really Rocky road. <laughs> Thank you. That's helpful. Um, did I see some other hands? Uh, okay. Yeah. Elizabeth. And then Jay. Um, I think I'm going to defer to Jay first and then I'll speak. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. Jay, go ahead. Thanks, Elizabeth. We might even have to share some similar thoughts here. Um, I think it, it's important to, to point out with, uh, um, with, with this property that there's a lot of local interest, um, in, particularly in the back, you know, 12 to 15 acres as, um, uh, for public use, uh, particularly around agriculture, um, uh, it is in, like Bill said, in the in the floodway, and so it's got a high qual high quality soil. Um, there's um, there's also a great potential. Uh, the the far end uh, of the property is the confluence of the Stevens Branch and the Winooski, um, so there's a lot of great river access potential um, throughout the property. Um, and so I know that not only has the newly formed Food Security Coalition um, spent time there, um, but also um, and, and talked about the potential future once you know once this Gordian knot of the legal issues around the, the building are are, are unraveled. Um, but there, uh, you know, there's just it's it's already being farmed on a, on a small scale, so there is a lot of potential to increase the capacity um, to. The potential to potentially even repurpose the building and see this as something of a Montpelier version of an intervale. So something at, at a smaller scale is, is very real. Um, and I know that um, uh, one more thing I'll add and then I'll hand it over to Elizabeth, but also is that you know the director of our parks department and other folks um, in parks uh, have been working there and have, have a lot of interest in the potential of the property overall. Thanks. Go ahead, Elizabeth. So, um, so I just wanted to say that I don't know if we've um, really made you all aware of the fact that there's a very uh, vital uh, food security coalition that has been meeting uh, four times they've met now and um, there are a number of working groups, uh, one of which is around um, uh, two rivers farm is what we're calling it, not uh, five home way. <laughs> but anyway, um, I, you know, in, in my history, I don't know, 35 years ago, I lived in Marshfield and we took the uh, Marshfield Village School and made it into a multi-purpose community center. And, um, and so I was the chairman of the Economic Development Committee in Marshfield. You know how small that is, but we raised then a half a million dollars to rehab the school. And so I look at that building uh, and see so many different uh, components of where funding can come from. And I have great hope that it can have a historic preservation part. It could possibly have housing on the second floor for uh, you know, farmers who are having small plots in the back 40 or 17 or whatever it is. Um, and, uh, and then have meeting space uh, and uh, some processing and storage space in the, in the barn and that there are multiple streams of um, grant money that can come in to, to bring it back to its former glory. Uh, so I know I sound like a dreamer, but I have had some background in this and I'm starting to look at the options. We had a wonderful uh, informational interview with Will Rapp uh, about Intervale and its, its beginnings. Uh, we've talked with Grow Food Northampton. We're just starting to interview a lot of communities that have managed to raise significant amount of money uh, and also have created a lot of jobs. Uh, you know, the goal would be uh, food production, job creation, um, housing, and energy uh, from our perspective. So anyway, uh, as more information becomes available from our end, we'll definitely share it with you. But um, we're, we have yet to, we're just starting to talk with the, um, oh my gosh, I have to get my nomenclature here. I may have to put on my glasses. 
uh, Vermont, oh yes, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And uh, we haven't talked with the AG's office yet. Bill's got a lot more information I was interested in hearing it. Um, but we're just starting to kind of understand the little Gordian knot that we have to deal with here to move forward. So um, that's yep. my my update just to let you know that that's out there in the ethers. I'd advise you to also to talk to Preservation Trust because even though they're yes, so they go through VHCB, they're the ones who actually hold the easement on the house. Right. It would seem to me that to, to do what you want to do affordably, um, they're still going to have to relax their easement somehow because I, I, I don't yet. I, I, I love your vision for this property. Um, I've also heard for five years or so different people with this similar type vision who have been unable to put together any kind of funding to, to do it. And but that's that's not me. <laughs> I know. But, uh, so I'm just saying is that, um, you know, I think from the, 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 at this point, you know, the city has really only two two roles in this. One is we are the potential owner of the back 15, which I think. I, I need to speak for the council, but I don't think anyone objects to that. I think that's a great, you know, thing. And we have a public nuisance that we're responsible for dealing with. And um, other than that, how other parties can sort this out is fine. And um, but someone has someone has to budge somehow. There's got to be, you know, there are a lot of players that have a lot of stake, and you know. I know you can get things done, Elizabeth. I also know that I've sat around those tables with many of those same people for a long time and listening to a lot of that, you know, Paul Bruins of the world and the, the folks that have moved a lot of mountains in Vermont. And, you know, here we are. The house is going to fall in. It won't be of historic value to anybody because nobody will have done anything. I appreciate your viewpoint, Bill, and I, and just, I want you to succeed. I, I'm just going to tell you, I, I'm going to give it a go. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, other thoughts from council? Otherwise, I have some I'm trying to outline, like, what are our choices? What are our options so that we can just be clear about potential options moving forward? But uh, go ahead, Jack. When this the question of the public nuisance came up um, and and the uh, the potential rescuers of the property came forward I, I was uh, very very skeptical I thought it was probably unrealistic and nearly impossible that uh, the, the money would be and the ways would be found to uh, bring this property back and, and really make their vision happen. But I was certainly willing to have the city uh, <clears throat> seal off the property so that it didn't pose an immediate uh, danger to public health and safety and, and give the people who at the time seemed to be the people in the community and in the area with the greatest degree of interest in making something of this property give it their try to come up with a plan and uh, and come up with the financing to make something happen and it turns out that it was they determined that it wasn't possible for them to do that i don't know that it's not possible for anyone to do that but nothing's made me Nothing in the interim has made me any less skeptical of the of the prospects for this property, and uh, <clears throat> I've been told at many of these meetings that this uh, house is of great historical significance to the city of Montpelier, but and maybe this is the site that it's always stood on as uh, as long as the building's been in existence but it's hard to picture that property being becoming a vital part of the uh, of the life of the community given 
where that property is and where the uh, center of the community and the, and the population of the community is now. So <clears throat> I think it's uh, important for the city to protect its interests, especially uh, protecting the public health and safety. Um, I'm not determined that we should go in and demolish the uh, the house next week now that uh, the people who thought they could save it have uh, thrown in their hand. But I don't want to wait forever either. It, it seems as though, you know, waiting forever is what's gotten the building to the place where it's, uh, where it's potentially falling down. And, and so I think we should, uh, <clears throat> we should be realistic about what can be done and what, who's going to come up with the money, what's a realistic timeline and, and not wait around forever for it with regard to the, you know, we know that we have uh, a real estate developer who has uh, a track record of uh, developing good properties in Montpelier and uh, providing economic benefit to the city who wants to do something with the property. And I don't think that's uh, nothing. Um, I see the value of a park and, you know, the mention of a dog park is... Uh, is a good idea because uh, that's something lacking in the city now. Also, it's worth keeping in mind, though, that uh, the demands of adding parkland to the city aren't just finding the, the land and declaring it a park. And, you know, to, to does the Parks Department have the uh, personnel to manage another 15 acres of parkland? And I think that's another question that we would want to look into before we decided to turn it into a park. So um, I'm, I'm happy to give uh, Elizabeth or anyone else who thinks they have a reasonable shot at doing it, a reasonable chance to try, but I'm not interested in waiting forever for that to happen. Thank you. Um, any other thoughts? So I, I've, so I, I feel like I have three options um, in front of us. And if there are more, if I've missed any, please, you know, chime in, but I mean, option one is do nothing right now, um, which is, I'm not sure I feel about that. Um, option two is um, move forward to initiate um, uh, collecting taxes on that. Do we need, but would we even need to vote on that? That's done. That's done. Okay. But, so that's, okay. But that's still going to be years away before that really. Right. All makes a difference. Right. And so, so then the third option, and may, maybe there's a fourth option here, but the, the one third option anyway, uh, or I guess it's really a second since um, we've already initiated, um, you know, collecting taxes on it, um, uh, is to pick a day um, that we would choose to demolish. Um, well, but then actually, let me back up on that. Would we, I guess, in the absence of any other plan, any other mitigation plan, would we have the authority to go demolish it? I think we would. Um, we, do under our, we do under our ordinance and um, we would then attach the cost of demolition to the, the property. Now, you know, I don't know if the house is gone, what that then means, you know, how, how restrictive the easements are, because now no one has to restore the house to its former condition. Um, so I, I don't know how that plays out. I'm not recommending this. We necessarily do that, but, uh, but yes, the city can, yeah. this, we're allowed to abate a public hazard. Yeah. One thing so, we might, go ahead. So, uh, well, I was going to say, I mean, uh, another 
potential choice we could make, and this is not necessarily even precluding other, you know, that option. Um, it feels like there could be an opportunity to do, to have a, a group of people come together to do some visioning for the property, even if it's just for the back part. Uh, if they part of the, you know, vision collecting for that property uh, includes something for the, um, for the building, then, you know, great. Uh, but I actually kind of wonder if we shouldn't, start thinking about that anyway, knowing that it seems likely that we would come like that, that at least the back part of the property may come to us anyway. Um, so thinking about, you know, do we want a dog park? Do you like how much of it should be ag? Um, how much of it should be park or, and what are the implications for all of those things? Like uh, that's not a, a question I feel like we here are going to resolve. Um, but somebody <laughs> should be having those conversations. Um, Cameron. Well, I just, Alec isn't here. So I do want to sort of, um, uh, don't want to put words in his mouth, but that is a space that he's um, interested in. As Jay said earlier, is developing and working on um, uh, in an agricultural way right now. So I would just advocate, sorry, I just don't want to be in the dark. Um, I would just advocate for including them in that, in that visioning and, and let them lead that because they do have some really big ideas for that space in its entirety. And they would be able to tell us if they do have the capacity. Um, because it's in the floodplain, I don't know how much it's um, able, like walking paths. There's a whole uh, host of environmental issues with that. So it might need to be just a concert, like an honest conservation space that is open to pub the public. Um, if I remember my um, conversations about that plot of land correctly. But there is some visioning work already happening. And I would urge you to um, allow them to be the, the sort of lead that you asked to for that for that work so so alec is um sort of in, in already sort of initiated the the a visioning process around that property yeah and he's part he's partnering with a lot of folks to make that that agricultural space a reality i'm sorry bill i interrupted and all I was going to say is I think the one thing as far as the back part that the council could do would be to affirmatively express an interest in in having that property come to the city. You know, we've talked about it and I've said, yeah, I think we are, and I know the parks are, but I don't think the city council has ever said, yeah, you know, the back part, we're happy to take on. We don't, that easement doesn't bother us. We're, you know, and I think they're planning, I think they're planning to give it to the city. I don't think it's going to cost us money. Um, maybe well, a little bit more about that, but um, that's the thing we can do. Well, let's hear from Elizabeth. I know you had another comment here, but then I want to kind of revisit um, particularly just that question that feels like a discrete thing that we can talk about and maybe collectively have an opinion about. Um, Elizabeth, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I like the idea of the uh, visioning process. Um, I actually just spent like a week writing a document about parties who might be interested in doing a visioning process for that property. Um, and there are, you know, in the Food Coalition, there are now probably about 16 different uh, entities that are part of the food network within uh, the greater Montpelier area. Uh, and um, although we haven't had Alex on the committee, we've had Jacqueline um, actively participating as, the vo of, as his voice. Uh, so there's a pretty active group of people who are really excited about this right now. So I'm excited to hear that you're thinking about um, including them. Thank you. Um, I do not know this person you're referring to. Jacqueline? Uh, Jacqueline is our VISTA and she will um, be moving in with us full time for the Parks Department starting after we start bringing folks back from furlough. Um, she's been an excellent member of our team for a while now and we're really excited to have her full time. So. Okay, great. Okay, thanks. Um, particularly about this question of um, are we interested in being the owners of the back part of the property. How many acres is it, Bill? The back part? 12, we don't 15. Know. Okay. It's Somewhere in that range. Okay. Um, any thoughts on that from the council? Uh, Jack. I think the answer is maybe. 
uh, when I when I saw this on the agenda, actually, what I was thinking was very much like uh, like your idea, and that uh, have some kind of uh, public process for people to uh, come and bring whatever ideas they have in mind and <clears throat> come up with a with a plan and see if it's workable. Um, and so I, that's what I would suggest we do, set some time for, the, for it to start and uh, some time for them to have a product and proceed from there. So are you suggesting that like we don't set effectively like an execution date <laughs> um, until this visioning process is over? Is that well, like what you're thinking or is that not? No. <clears throat> That's totally what I'm thinking, assuming that it's uh, a reasonable timeline, which I'm thinking is probably three to six months. I don't know what uh, how long it takes to do something like that, but that just is what feels feels right to me. Seems That seems fair. Um, any thoughts on either that or the idea of the, cal the, the city uh, owning the back part? I'll just speak for myself and say that I'm I'm interested in having the city um, own the back part, whether that's for a park or uh, any of the other ideas that have come up. Uh, I think it has a lot of potential, and particularly since it is um, in the floodway, that there's there is limited um, possibilities for it. Um, but even the possibilities that exist, I think, are. So, uh, purposes that might serve the city. So, one suggestion we could do, I see, you know, Bob's still on the call, is we could reinspect the building. We haven't been there, I don't think, since last year. Um, and so, uh, and maybe I'm wrong about that, but we could uh, assess its condition, you know, has it worsened? Is it more dangerous? Um, and that might also inform our decision making. If it stayed relatively stable, then that might say, okay, you know, we can. We can allow for a longer. It's it's because our again our issue is the public nuisance and making sure it's secure and making sure that if someone you know homeless people whoever were to get in there uh, that they're or, or just kids breaking in for the heck of it um, that they're safe uh, that there wouldn't be a calamity uh, or disaster. Um, so that might be one step we could take in terms of figuring out how how imminent the demolition ought to be. And then maybe set a period of time, whether it's for a visioning uh, or just simply we'll accept proposals. We'll give you, you know, set a date in the fall or something for people to come in and say, here's our ideas for the, the property. And maybe, you know, maybe Elizabeth and her group will have organized a group and they've, it will be a single proposal or maybe it'll be, you know, people with proposals for private loose. But I think part of those proposals has to be how do we address these outstanding issues. It can't just be, we think this is what should happen to the property. It needs to be, here's how we're dealing with the uh, easements. Here's how we're dealing with the mortgage holder. Here's how we're dealing with all of these other complications. Because if those, if those aren't addressed, I mean, that's what's prevented all the other good ideas from going forward over the last several years. It's not. Okay, um, I saw Jay, then Donna. I'll defer to Donna, go ahead. Well, just this has been a long process, and I got really excited with proposals and the reports that kept coming back and kept hoping something would happen. I would like to see two groups. One, start dealing with legality and what really is the ownership and all of that, and another group that does the visioning. And just take three months and see what we can do in that period of time. And then we may have to just cut bait and take the house down. But I, I'd like to see it approached two separate ways. I think there are different mindsets. So I think two different groups are needed. Um, Jay, do you want to talk? Well, you know, I, I just, um, I, I agree uh, with the mayor that I do think the property itself is, uh, would be a great asset to the city, um, you know, particularly, 
Um, with the extension of the bike path that leads to just about right across the street from it, it could be a real community resource. Um, I do think that absolutely we need to go through an appropriate um, visioning process to uh, to determine what's the best use of uh, you know of the land and and what's feasible. The fact that it, you know we have to remember that it was in 2011 um, that the the two floods that happened in that year is ultimately what was the dissolved the nonprofit that was operating on the land. So we, you know, we have to be very conscious about all the implications of, um, of, of what managing that property would look like, but I don't, and I don't, I'm not actually going to make a recommendation on substantive steps that we can take as a council right now, but I do think Donna is right. We need to approach this from, you know, from, from two sides. And it seems to me like the, the, the visioning, could sort of move on its own, making certain assumptions, because like Bill said, there is a, a good chance no matter what happens legally with the building that um, even if it were to go to the Connors, that the city would end up with the back the back acreage. So I think that that you know, can move forward with that assumption, but having somebody, having a, a group, a working group that was focused on you know, engaging with the AG's office and all the different players, you know, and I know that Bill, you know, has started that process and brought people together, but that could be proactive and try to get some, you know, the more definitive course forward would be, would be great. Um, I do also want to express some support for uh, re-inspecting the building. Um, one of my concerns uh, in all of this is that, in all honesty, my concern is that the building has bad bones, so to speak, right? And so if that's the case, like how much of it is, is actually sal salvageable? Um, and, and I mean, because I mean, one possibility is that um, it would literally be cheaper to tear it down and like build a new building that was on a solid foundation uh, and maybe elevated even, you know, so it doesn't, it, you know, was not quite as flooded like that. I don't, I don't know if that would be cheaper than trying to repair the building that exists, it, but it, it might. Um, and uh, Lena, that's all that is a part of the, the question a anyway. And also if it's, if it's about to fall down, like if it really, if it's so bad, that um, it is going to be falling down, you know, eminently, like any any you know day now. Um, then then that would well that would just be really important to know because uh, because then that's a different public health threat, and that is sort of that is our responsibility. Um, uh, so you know, knowing how close we are to structural failure, I, I think is probably uh, important. Um, Dan, go ahead. Sure, uh, and uh, I wanna disclose, my, my firm represents the Preservation Trust of Vermont. We haven't been representing them in this particular case so far to my knowledge, um, but I do wanna be careful about um, that potential conflict. But I, I agree, um, with the with your comments about um, the public, not just the public nuisance, but the public danger, um, you know, because that is a uh, structure, you know, the liability to the owner, but also the danger presented by it may be enhanced. And and if it hasn't been inspected in a year, I think it's important to just understand: Are we dealing with a an immediate emergency? Um, and that, I think that would be regardless of who has what interest in this, um, you know, that's something that's important to know. And I think that's, that's the critical first step um, to figure out what the public health, uh, the immediate public danger posed by this building is or might be, um, and whether it could be used for some of the additional information, I don't know, and I'm, I'm not gonna necessarily comment on it, but, um, you know, it strikes me that, that beyond that, um, Bill, did you get a sense of whether the parties were kind of at the table or whether they had sort of uh, reached a stalemate as far as the various interest groups in this case? I think there was some discussion. Um, they were at the table 
I'm not sure all the cards have been played. Um, and um, and I think there are, you know, there are some solutions that are more sticky than others. Uh, and so, I, you know, it's hard to say. Um, I, I think there seemed to be some desire to find out what the city was going to do. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've pushed back and said, well, there's a whole host of options here, some of which you are all participants. Um, but I think they want to know if we're just going to tear the building down uh, or if we're going to set a D uh, because then that, that creates a different set of contingencies for them. It sets, you know, a decision from us, you know, I think things the city could do in terms of decisions, one is just set a date to take the building down. Two is to say, we prefer it be private development or we prefer it be publicly held or we prefer to have time for a group like Elizabeth's to see if, if the, the spirit of these easements can be, uh, you know, maintained. So, but even some pre preference from us right now, I've just said, any of it sounds great. We don't prioritize one over the other. We are interested in the back in theory, um, but we, we don't want to continue a public hazard of the building. But it, that's been my statement. So I think the pushback to us has been, well, then what are you guys going to do? Well, I mean, there seems like a, a couple of different things. I mean, I think there's the immediate threat, whether this is a, you know, a danger, the, the stick house that's about to fall over, or if it's something that's just slowly decaying. Um, but something you said earlier is that the city's not likely to get it's money back that it invests in tearing out and tearing it down. In other words, if we just, if we, if, well, I, I say that, I mean, right. If we, I could be wrong about this, but, if we, but we're, in, we're, we're third on the, the line of creditors. Right. You know? Right. Right. Um, and so, so we would be doing that as a mitigation method. It would be a cost of enforcing. It would be the cost of mitigating public danger wouldn't be part of a project cost. Right, I'm, I, which I think makes sense if there's an eminent danger as right. opposed to simply saying, you know, I mean, in, in some ways, tearing it down makes it easier for, for everyone and saves a couple of costs. So, right. um, you know, I guess that's, that, that's the one thing I guess I would question. Sure, and you know, Bob has been in that building. So he, you know, last year, he's probably the most knowledgeable to tell us, you know, obviously it's a year's we're old, but he, you know, how, eminent, at least oh, whatever his take of the condition of the building is. Yeah, the, the last time we, we were in it, um, the, the entire building was not in imminent danger of falling down. The porches, there's a set of two-story porches on the front of the building that are in bad shape. They could collapse. Um, Food Works has done, did a lot, a lot of, of work in that building, including putting a new foundation under about half of it. So the foundation, the cement foundation under about half of it is not that old. What we will do though is um, we'll get back in there. We can get back in there in the next week or so and take another look at it. And we'll, I'll also bring um, the Division of Fire Safety has a structural engineer who we have access to. So we'll, um, I'll reach out to him or have Chris Lumber reach out to him tomorrow. And we'll get Chris and I'll get back up there with the structural engineer and take another look. That would be great. Uh, That's relevant going forward is knowing exactly what what the state of the building is that we're dealing with. Because it's one thing to have a wonderful vision and it's another, I'm, I'm a pragmatist of the highest order. So I look forward to your report, Bob. You know, I, so we could maybe conclude that you know, at least theoretically, it's not going to fall down tomorrow. Porches might, but the rest of it won't. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Lauren. Um, I was just going to, I, mean, I think that's great to get a reassessment of the state of the house. Um, and then I was just going to go back to Donna's idea, which I liked of having, you know, one group that's really focused on the legal questions and one group on the vision um, for the property and the back property and maybe writ large. Um, so I, and like with a, a real timeline thinking to Jack's comment of, you know, not dragging things out forever. So maybe the three months was a good 
you know, give us some time to really put something down on paper for the visioning and, and answer some of the legal questions, or if they're still just as much of a morass as they are right now, then that would be good to know too. And <laughs> um, so I was just going to relift that up and okay. see if there was interest in that approach. It sounds like there, there is some interest in that. I, there, I have a few questions about that. Um, but I, I just want to make sure I we revisit um, this one topic. Does is anybody particularly not interested in um, the back uh, acreage? Jack is maybe everyone else is like I, I'm taking your your silence as like the uh, uh, yeah straw poll. Like do you do you want the back acreage? This could be like maybe or I don't know. Okay. Okay, so okay, so we have like two maybes, and I think we had more yeses. Um, I don't think we need to vote on that. I just wanted to see where we're at. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's that's one thing. Um, in terms of you know having these two groups um, do visioning, at least in terms of like visioning for the property, whether that's the back or it's the whole thing. Um, I mean, it, it sounds like Elizabeth's group is meeting and it has some representation from the parks department um there um through jacqueline um but I've been, uh, I've been involved with those meetings as well sorry oh you have been okay yeah. okay well so i mean w just zooming out for a second like one of my concerns there is that if that is a desire of this council that we have a visioning group that um I mean, one possibility is that those meetings should be open to the public um, if it's like a council group. Um, like, so, so one question is like, is that a council group or could it be a private group? And then, you know, y'all are just doing your own thing and really under the auspices of a different organization. And so that's fine. Um, I just think that that it would be good to be clear about that. Um, and or are, are we sort of letting the, you know, are, are we endorsing the work of this group or, you know, or even like gonna you know, delay things for the sake of a private group or is it our own group? Um, is, that's really my question. Before you go, Elizabeth, any thoughts from council on that? Yeah, Jack. I said that I thought it was should be a private process or a public process. The more I think of it, the more I think maybe it doesn't have to be because you know we know of a group of people that uh, is already uh, thinking about or working on uh, ideas for what could happen to the real estate. But there could be other people who also have ideas who who might, if, if we say, okay, we want to have somebody come to the council by whatever date, October 15th or whatever date it is, um, it could be that someone else could could take that as a signal to put together their own idea and also present it to the council. And so, and that's fine if they do. Yeah. Um, Lauren. I think I generally agree with that. The, the only thing I am feeling cautious about with that approach is just knowing how challenging this property is and there's so much context. Like I would hate for someone to waste their time doing a vision without, you know, necessarily having the opportunity to speak to all the players and understand all the complexities of it and and maybe a more formal process that ensures that all the right, you know, voices and legal entanglements and everything are known, understood, and that something's being put forward that would actually be feasible um, and work. That's just one consideration. Um, thing is also too, if it's a city group, then I think we actually probably have to make an appointment to it as like a working group, which would take a lot of time potentially. So it's almost just easier to have it be a private group. But um, Elizabeth, go ahead. So I just wanted to say that on, you know, that it, this visioning that's happening is not under the auspices of any one group. This is a, a coalition of people. And, and I, I'm, you know, kind of in the, my thing as an organizer is to involve people. And I, we certainly would be happy to uh, make the process more public and uh, 
you know, basically, I don't know, have some design charrettes or, you know, whatever it is that would be part of the visioning uh, in order to make it very public and get as many people in to walk the property. And, you know, I, I do think it'd be great to put together some sort of um, uh, written description of the, of the legal conundrum uh, so that people could know that um, in general. Uh, and I don't know whether the city can take, you know, Donna's idea of having the, the legal avenue figured out or, or, or someone going down that road. Um, but yeah, go ahead, Donna. I'm just putting my hand up for my turn after you. Don't let me interrupt. Oh. Okay, well, I thought you had a brilliant idea. I was going to do Oh, it. absolutely. Always. <laughs> it's always. Uh, uh, but, um, yeah, so I, I just think that, you know, some of these things do need to be put together, and I'm just happy to uh, help facilitate that in whatever way I can. Uh, Donna, go ahead. Well, I was really feeling they don't need to know all the legal entanglements. They should just vision the property. I mean, again, and I think vision the property, particularly without the house, and even maybe a, a real light drawing of something totally different on stilts, whatever, but that they just deal with the property in a vision. And then that's why I separated them. Because the legal stuff we know, this other group has gone on, what, five years? <laughs> Trying to un tangle it. Um, so I, I wanted that to be separate purposefully. I don't think you need to know the legal stuff to look at the land and decide what you'd like to do with it. That's all. Yeah, Bill. Um, so a couple things about the legal thing. One, um, right, we, we certainly understand the legal situation. I think the question is how do you move forward past it? And to some extent, you know, one of the reasons there's been a legal stalemate is that each, I think each group that's been involved uh, to date, excluding the city, uh, well, we've been involved from the public safety aspect, but in terms of the use of the property, has been involved from the point of view of asserting their legal rights for the outcome that they would like to see. So to some extent, us, you know, if we're interested in a particular outcome, then we would probably pursue how do you get that legally? Does that mean, uh, you know, so let's just say for the sake of argument that we really wanted this to be developed privately, whether it was a Connors or somebody else, you know, we might be then looking at how do we extinguish these easements? What, what, you know, do we, does, do we, does, what is the role the city can play taking it by eminent domain or whatever, you know, or declaring it abandoned to somehow take these restrictions away to, to open it up for other things. If our goal is that we want the whole thing to be in the public's, you know, we want whether we own it or it's open to the public, then our role might be, hey, Preservation Trust, how can we work out something? You know, maybe you pay for the building to come down, but we keep it, you know, we'll help, we'll, you know, so I think, I think there's, Right now, there's just a lot of people have competing visions for the property, and our we've said we just want it to be safe. Um, so if we want to become a player, then then you know we're that's a different role than we've had. I think we can, you know, I could picture a group like Elizabeth's uh, partnering with VHCB and the, the Preservation Trust and saying this is what we want to further our interests with this easement. And then that party would have to figure out, okay, what does that mean for the bank getting paid off? What does that mean for, for Connor's right of first refusal? And then they'll have to negotiate those out somehow. Um, so, so a lot of the, the legal is um, what are people interested in and, and what do we want to come up with? So, you know, there's no, there's no specific legal outcome here until we figure out the path. So, you know, it's like, how do we want to, where are we going and how do we get there? So, so perhaps the legal questions almost have to wait until we know what, what we want. Right. And what, yeah. or maybe what other people, you know, it may be what we, the city want, or it may be what the easement holders want. 
I mean, they invested money to, to have an outcome on these properties. So they have a lot of say. Uh, so, you know, maybe it's, they say, fine, if, if you can raise the money to build this, you know, we'll let you tear it down if you're going to rebuild it in this new way. You got to pay off the bank and we'll go to court with you if Connor tries to force his right of first refusal. You know, they, who knows? I mean, there's any number of outcomes that could happen and we can't speak for any of those agencies, but, but you know, Elizabeth and her pals should certainly reach out and see where, you know, what they're open to and doing. I think what we could communicate to folks is we're interested in seeing something happen. We certainly would be interested in the back property and um, we're gonna inspect the property. You know, our, we're just gonna sit tight and keep assuring that the property's safe and let the rest of you sort it out. Yeah. Yeah, that's an option. Um, now that, so that, that makes sense to me just in terms of um, as, a, as a process, you know, giving kind of as Jack was suggesting, perhaps like three to six months somewhere in there um, for some visioning to happen. And then, you know, hopefully with some public aspects to the process, hopefully in partnership with VHCB and the Preservation Trust and, and uh, hopefully it, with those partnerships and some, maybe some public design charrette opportunities uh, that we can at least have a vision for what might be good for that property and particularly like, you know, with that building. Um, you know, because gosh, like it could, it could be, it could be very expensive. And, but the thing is like, if there's a clear articulated vision, then it's something that people can rally around. Um, or, or even if it's something like, well, we got to tear the building down to rebuild something or, you know, or we say, you know, we're going to hold this building in our hearts on this sign and, you know, value it for what it was and have a historic marker. And that's, you know, all that we can really accomplish, then, then like, that's fine. But um, just so that we have a um, uh, clear picture of what, where we'd like to go. And, um, and I guess I, I'd like to just wait quickly. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's right. And I think given all that the city has going, I'm not sure we should be the leader of that process. Um, I think we can help, we can stimulate things. Our, our role right now is, is protecting you know, dealing with the public nuisance, we can help facilitate. But you know, VHCB at least, their money comes from the public. I know Preservation Trust comes from donations. I mean, there's no reason that there couldn't be a public process, whether it's, you know, Elizabeth's group and those, they're the easement holders. They're the ones that acquired an easement for a desired outcome. Why can't they, you know, are they just gonna sit passively and wait for, someone else to figure it out while the building deteriorates or are they going to take or at least partner with someone who's going to take a more active role in, in addressing these problems I mean, that's been the frustration is that everyone's dug in and said well th these are my rights but nobody's doing anything to actually address the problem and so i i like this i say you know to, here's a period of time come back to us in six months with what the rest of you have come up with as long as the, we're satisfied the building's safe, we won't do anything in the meantime. Yeah. How about uh, Donna, did you have something? Well, Donna, I, and Jack, and then Elizabeth. I just feel the previous partnership tried to do that, and people and the groups didn't come forward with ideas. And I'd like to see the land looked at without the house. The house and the historic preservation is a huge price tag. And I'd really like to see about what the land is. How do we want to use the land? which doesn't have this huge price tag. <laughs> so anyway, that's all. It's fair. Jack. I was just thinking about the timeline a little bit. I threw out three to six months as an idea. Now that I think about that, if people come back to us in six months, that's right as we're getting into budget season. And this is not going to be an uncomplicated thing. So maybe something more in the four to five month than six month uh, line would, would be uh, more practical. Donna is saying three, and I'm, I'm certainly fine with three if 
people think that uh, that's enough time. And I don't know. I'm, I'm looking at Elizabeth here. Yeah, Elizabeth, what do you it think? It doesn't seem like very much time, especially when people are not voting or not meeting in person. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's complicated, isn't it? Um, you know, the, uh, when I did the project 35 years ago in Marshfield and brought a half a million dollars to rehab an old school, it was a kind of a miracle. And people say to me now, what, how did that happen? And the way it happened was because there was a lot of public involvement, because we got a lot of people really asking the question of what should be done. And there were all sorts of possibilities in the beginning. And then we just kept moving forward. And, and as one possibility dropped out, people rallied around the, the you know, the possibility that, that um, went forward. Uh, it, it's it's hard to organize in the summer. I'm going to say that. Uh, I appreciate your budget uh, concerns. Uh, it, it's hard to organize during COVID-19. You all know that from the work we've done with CAN. Um, however, it's not impossible. However, um, much as, as I understand Donna's pragmatic three months, I, I would ask for the the four to five month option, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty uh, much of a straight shooter. And if things, you know, are, I, I think there should be two visionings. I think there should be visioning for the back property. I think there should be visioning for the, the house and the property. Um, and um, if nothing is coming forward, then I would be the first to tell you that. I don't need to wait until the last minute if it's not working. Uh, Donna. I guess again, thinking of everything else, if you think four months, I'm thinking like October, November, but once you miss November, then you get into December and January, and you know, so then you're into spring. So I think it's either November, which maybe it happens, but doesn't, but I think it'd be good to have a goal like November and that doesn't happen. Then you move it to the spring of next year. Here's an idea. How about this? Again, I'm trying to try to put, keep us in our lane. So the city is, maybe the city takes a position that the building's not in imminent collapse, but it needs to be monitored. So we're going to inspect, we'll inspect it again in four to five months. We'll inspect it now, we'll expect it again. And we're willing to allow an indeterminate period of time for people to work on this as long as the building can still stand. And in the meantime, we're, if the solution involves taking the back of the property, we're willing to entertain that. When, you know, we're, we're generally favorable to that and we'd like to see what that use might be. And then they can come back with their plan whenever they want, understanding that if the building gets dangerous, we're going to take it down. And we're going to deal with the hazard. So um, then there's no real, I mean, it, their timing coming to us is really going to matter if they're looking for money from the city. Then it's going to tie in with budget anyway. And if they're not looking for money from the city, they just look for the city say, yeah, we'll sign off on this plan or we'll take this property. They can do that anytime. And it keeps that, us in the enforcer role. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Dan. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think that makes sense and keeps us in our lane as a city um, because we don't want to put ourselves too deep into the middle of this Gordidian knot. Um, so I'm I'm supportive of that. Okay. Connor's giving us a thumbs up. Oh, more thumbs up. Okay. Oh, more thumbs up. Great. Uh, Jack. I'll, I'll just remind people. You know, Jay mentioned the Gordian unraveling the Gordian knot eventually, and I'll just remind people that what happened to the Gordian knot it did not get unraveled. <laughs> Alexander the Great slashed through with his sword. Um, uh oh. <laughs> more, more reason not to be at the middle of that knot. Or <laughs> <laughs> we may demolish the building. Yeah. Whack! <laughs> yeah. um, I always say the word yet. <laughs> um, okay. Um, there are a bunch of thumbs up on that. Bill, do you need a, a 
motion to that effect. I'm not sure that we do. No, because we're not taking any real action other than continuing to monitor exactly. the property. Yeah. And um, I can report this to that group. Okay. Continue uh, to work with them. Great. Uh, okay. Well, I actually feel like we made so a few decisions around this topic, which is helpful. Um, you know, in terms of continuing to reinspect the building, you know, looking forward to this visioning process. That's not, that's not a city process necessarily. Um, and, uh, Which is not to say we won't participate and be active. Right. You know, our parks people and everyone else will be, you know. Yep. And, and it sounds like most folks are feeling thumbs up or at least middle uh, about uh, the back property. So, um, so that, that um, feels like some decisions which is good. I'm also conscious of the time where better, better. I didn't want to cut off that conversation because I felt like we were actually making some progress. Um, so, but uh, I think we're, I think we're relatively done. Any other comments on, on this topic? Okay. Awesome. Thank you all for hanging in there through <laughs> this topic. Uh, okay. So I think we're basically just about at the end here. Um, so, gosh, uh, council reports. We'll start with Donna. We'll go around as if we were in person. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm so sorry that Donna Casey is gone, but I wanted to thank DPW. Oops, I cut myself off. <laughs> I wanted to thank DPW for coming, and we had a water breakage out here in my neighborhood. They took them all day. They did it. Um, didn't even have a water uh, boil order, so very appreciative, but also just to – wish everybody a happy july 4th and sorry we're not having a third parade but get outside but be smart be safe that's all um great connor i've got a couple things actually um first off the legislative subcommittee uh met yesterday it was uh bill lauren dan and myself only lasts about 45 minutes. I think it was a good meeting. We were saying, Mike, if we could shed the other four up, yeah, we could take this out every day, like uh, record time. <laughs> but uh, I think we we're on the same page. You know, we wanted to start uh, slow. And um, the thought was, we've got a legislative agenda. A lot of it's like kind of a moot point at this point. Uh, the big fish to fry are, you know, we'd love to shake some trees, see where the money is as far as this COVID stuff is. Uh, see if there are any opportunities to pull down grants from the state. So, you know, Dan was saying, like, maybe merge our legislative agenda with that. Uh, we still have an obligation to get our charter changes over the finish line. And uh, we still have our non-citizen U.S. Uh, non-U.S. citizen voting uh, charter change in the Senate. They have a lot of downtime. So is there maybe a possibility that we could get that over the finish line um, in the next few weeks here? It's worth looking at, but... Uh, Bill, Bill gave really good historical perspective on this. And um, th there was a time when the delegation would come in and meet with the council and have a good conversation where maybe sometimes they'd say, ah, you're nuts going after this, you know? Or, yeah, that's a good idea. I can, like, uh, I can look at that. And I, I think where, where we came out was sort of revamp the legislative agenda with the, uh, you know, sort of COVID items there and invite the uh, five members of our delegation to the July meeting to go over it with them and just have a bit of a conversation there. So, you know, I, as we get into the future, um, I think we could look at expanding the committee. We have a lot of lobbyists in town. We have people who like, you know, work in state government, would be able to see these opportunities, give us a heads up. Uh, but for the moment, it seems very practical just to invite the, the, the gang in in July, go over this with them, uh, keep monitoring the committee hearings as they go on. And uh, I think that's a great first step. So if the council was okay with it, I think Bill was going to draft a letter tomorrow morning, uh, just given that formal invite. So I don't know if we need a vote or just like a nod of the heads. That'd be great there. Awesome. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say was uh, a week ago Saturday, I thought it was a beautiful day. Um, you know, I, I know it was messy again there. I know we probably colored outside the lines, which is a bad uh, analogy for a painting thing uh, at times, but it, it was really good to see between two and 300 members uh, of our community and all over the state of Vermont come and uh, 
I, I think we thought this would take like hours and hours, but it, it could have been done in half an hour for everything. But new Americans came and I think as we're entering really difficult conversations, it was really nice just to have like an affirmation of the most basic values that like, okay, black lives matter. And within 24 hours, I think we saw sort of the best and worst of humanity, you know, the best in everybody just coming together and doing this and a good celebratory feeling. Uh, the worst obviously with the vandalism. Um, but then again, like the next night I went down at nine o'clock at night and I, I'll tell this really briefly. There was a group of teenagers, right? And they were kind of sizing me up and they came up to me and I, I was wondering what they were doing and they were wondering what I was doing. And we looked at each other and uh, I said, wait a minute, are you guys standing guard? And they nodded and there was a young woman, probably like five feet tall. And she goes, yeah, we're gonna mess them up if they try that again. <laughs> and I thought, what a beautiful thing in our town, you know, like, okay, this horrible thing happened, but that's like stepping up to the place. Um, so I, I really just want to thank everybody on council who made this happen. I want to thank uh, the city employees and especially like Department of Public Works and the fire department that were out there. I want to thank the community who we had like five people out the next day just on their hands and knees scraping the pavement, getting every bit out of there. Um, and I, I most of all want to thank Noel, who's, you know, uh, raised in our community, went through our school system, was a champion with the Black Lives Matter flag. And, and my God, did she get this over the finish line in record time? And she's just an inspiration. And uh, I, I think somebody we can all look up to there. So, uh, again, thanks a lot. That was, that was a beautiful day. And, um, you know, even the, even the graffiti on the sidewalk, I think, sends an important message that there is racism and hate in our community and in Vermont. Uh, but we're up to the task of having these hard conversations and trying to address it. So that's me. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, Jay. All I'll say is, is, uh, thank you, Connor, for, for all of your efforts with this. Um, and it was, uh, it was incredible. It was an incredible day. It was an incredible, uh, event to be a part of, um, and to, to, not only from a, a, govern, a governance, but also the way the city rallied and how the community rallied um, to make it happen. Uh, I, I, like you said, it, it just spoke to to the um, to who our what our community stands for um, and how we face challenges. So that's all. Thanks. Great. I could just like uh, Jay flew a drone and took that picture of the Black Lives Matter thing on the street. And that was so cool. It's like we had people calling saying they saw it on CNN. So thanks a lot for that, Jay. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Dan. Um, the uh, Rather than plow already furrowed ground, um, I got a call from a constituent ask, 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 asking about graffiti on the bike path. Apparently there's, uh, you know, new canvas spawns, new creative endeavors, but uh, I know that there was uh, some profanity out there um, that's causing some concern, uh, at least one constituent. So I know Department of Public Works really does that a great job of, of covering that up, but uh, I'll simply raise it. I got the call today, uh, someone fairly concerned. So I think we have to just be be careful about that. Um, did she, did, sorry, did they tell you uh, where it was specifically so we can note that? Uh, I think it was in the new section um, out towards um, uh, uh, Gallison Hill, but um, I didn't ask them for the specific location. Um, okay, thank I you. Know, I know there was a new piece down by at the end of the um, parking lot by the uh, behind the garage where the the bridge abutment there for the uh, bridge over the river, um, but I'll, you know we we still um, you know that's the beauty of local government is that um, there are no Republicans Democrats progressives there are members of the community um, and just as we celebrate these really big moments of coming together. We always have these little small moments too of trying to keep our community livable and and pleasant for everyone. So it's plowing the streets as well as painting the streets. <laughs> yeah, uh, Jack. 
Uh, just one very quick thing, and be, maybe Bill is planning on mentioning this too, but uh, a couple of years ago, it seems, we set up a committee or a working group to uh, revise the uh, tax stabilization policy, and Bill and I just met the other day to uh, put the uh, finishing touches on it, and so probably in our July meeting, we will uh, be coming back to council with uh, with our proposed uh, changes to the tax stabilization policy, and then we will be able to check one more item off our to-do list. Cool. Fair enough. Um, Lauren. Um, yeah, just a couple quick things. Um, one, I also wanted to acknowledge the great Juneteenth celebration that we had. I don't know who was able to make it out for that, but on really short notice and, you know, Jack has taken the initiative the last couple of years to um, put forward a resolution for the city, um, but there was great speeches, music, poetry, um, really great turnout. And it was just a beautiful event for our community. And again, Noel was a leader in that and just, Edgerly Walsh, former city councilor, and um, so just some acknowledgement there for a, a great event on pretty short notice, and and that was really wonderful to see. And you know we're not having our July third celebration, so having that uh, Freedom Day celebrated was was pretty great. Um, just wanted to mention it came up a little bit before in the meeting, uh, but just for you all, the Social and Environment and Economic Justice Advisory Committee. Um, is continuing to meet and thank you to Cameron for um, keeping those meetings going because we are trying to get um, the contract out that we've been talking about for a while um, and do some of these, uh, our equity work that we've been committed to. So that is moving on and when we have um, progress to report, I'll do that, but just, just letting you know that we're gonna be touching base um, with the people who'd put in proposals earlier in the year that we put on hold and seeing if we can, can get that process going. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to mention, I brought it up a few weeks ago, but um, with elections, so when John speaks, I don't know if we need to, it might be good to put on the agenda, um, just a quick check-in on what's happening. I mean, there's different procedures this year. We might wanna do, you know, I know that volunteers in, in our community, like many communities are a lot of older people. We might wanna do a call out for a volunteer pool for it, the in-person voting and get some young people and, um, so just wanted to, to get some attention on, on that and what the city might need to do, especially if it's gonna take some time to recruit people for, um, for the in-person. I know we're gonna encourage lots of people to vote by mail, um, request your absentee ballot, but um, anyway, just, just wanted to raise that again to see how we can help support that and raise the profile of any, any changes that are happening due to COVID. That's it, thanks. Great. Um, so thank you all for um, for your comments already. I mean, you covered, uh, uh, gosh, it's, it's been an intense few weeks, right? Like um, beyond even just the national news, uh, I was thinking about, um, uh, gosh, all the, the emails that we have been getting uh, about uh, uh, police reform, about uh, racial issues uh, and, uh, you know, from uh, you know navigating the the Black Lives Matter to then the the vandalism um, and then the, the great effort of people afterwards to to clean it up as well as a standing watch that's just amazing and the Juneteenth celebration was uh, was fabulous people I thought did a really great job staying socially distanced through that and also it felt like a festival um, without also feeling dangerous somehow uh, which was great and I just wanted to note. Um, about that particularly, uh, it, so it, it came up uh, to me, you know, could we make Juneteenth a bigger deal in future years, uh, perhaps somehow more on par with um, with the July 3rd celebration? And I, I think that um, is, is worth talking about. Now, to be fair, uh, that's really Montpelier Live's domain, but... Uh, uh, but I, I did talk with Dan Groberg about that, and I uh, just want to make uh, you all aware that they have grants for uh, for events, and so he thought that might be um, potentially like 
you know, making Juneteenth a, a bigger event in the future, uh, it could be a, a good candidate for a grant of theirs. But of course, that would have to be led by um, someone else. So anyway, I just wanted to say that out loud, um, but not just necessarily for Juneteenth. If there are other events that people are interested in um, in fostering in Montpelier, there's potentially some money to do that. Um, and, you know, even besides that, I, I'm just, I'm so grateful for, for you all, um, and for the city staff to, uh, particularly in, in holding, um, uh, tension between, you know, having a deep respect for our police department and also believing that we, um, can be better. Um, and that is, um, you know, sometimes a tough place to be, but I'm, I'm thankful for all of the, the deep breathing that you all are doing and, um, and, and working through all of this. And I know it, uh, it's, uh, it's been, it's been some intense times. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful to have, uh, you all to, um, be thinking critically and, uh, and honestly about all these, these tough issues in a way that, uh, honors, uh, all, all the folks in our community. So, um, and at the same time, you know, so thankful for our, um, for our, our staff working hard on, on these topics and, um, and also just doing a great job. So, um, anyway, that's, uh, so that's uh, all I've got for now. Um, and so I guess I will turn it over to, uh, John. Look, I got the crazy hair here. Um, nothing to report. It, well, no, what am I saying? Ballots are pretty are in. I'm just waiting for envelopes. So overseas um, ballots will be going out, start going out Friday. And that should also be when I start sending out the requests, the early voting requests we've got. So it's going to be a little more complicated with the office closed. There's a big push from the Secretary of State. They're mailing to everybody, um, everybody everywhere to encourage them to vote early. Um, I expect it to impact my workflow dramatically. We'll have scaled down election day. We, I don't think it's practical for us to do outside or drive up voting. So we'll just work on a, a really uh, managed traffic process up one side of the front of City Hall and down the other with social distancing. So, I mean, we'll make that work, I think. I think we're pretty uniquely set up to be able to manage that pretty well. So that's what I'm thinking with all that. I just, the Lauren was asking. I do have a very deep well of volunteers. I usually get 50 to 60 folks, you know, of all age groups out there. And I know there's potentially more. So, but if you, you know, touch base with me about that if you want. Um, I've got a lot more potentially I could pull from too that I don't have emails for. So good crowd, Montpelier folks. Oh my God, do they turn out for the elections for, for volunteering? It's, it's crazy. I'm so fortunate to be doing this work here. Um, Bill. Uh, first of all, I think um, this may have been the first time that Alexander the Great was cited in a council meeting. So I just like to recognize that as a momentous occasion. Uh, I forgot to note earlier um, when we were uh, honoring Chief Fakus that yesterday he was presented with the uh, Vermont Police Officer of the Year by the American Legion and honored in front of the police station and a small gathering, but kind words said and again, well-deserved. Can't, can't say enough about them. Um, we're in, you know, as we mentioned, we're in this weird time where things that you would normally want to have big, be big, huge events, we have to be cautious. But that said, I'd also uh, like to note that uh, next Wednesday, July 1st at 9 a.m., we will be swearing in Chief Pete, uh, who I see is lurking in the background here, uh, in front of City Hall. And uh, we'll, of course, be op assuming the weather's good, it'll be opening to the, open to the public, but we urge people to be distant. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, the mayor will say a few words and... Um, it won't be a lengthy thing, but it will definitely be important. It's a, a big change for our, our community. So we thank Tony for his great work and our department. Uh, and I'd also note, I know I see Constantinus is still on and, and for the group that uh, that has expressed opinions and 
perhaps feeling frustrated they haven't heard responses. Um, the mayor and I are meeting with Chief Pete on the 2nd uh, to start talking about the processes by which we would evaluate these questions and the public outreach. Um, and so uh, this is being taken seriously and we have we're tentatively allocating some time, I think for the second meeting in August to, to be on our agenda. So hopefully I've had some community outreach before then. So um, all interesting challenges. And uh, I think that's all I've got for tonight. Unless, do I have more Cameron or am I good? <laughs> Great. Um, okay then, so um, that is it. So without objection, all right, so late, everybody. Um, here we are. So I'm going to, um, without objection, um, declare the meeting adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Have an excellent rest of your night. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. <clears throat>